What's up guys? It's yo boy Omnisensei. Welcome to a new series, What If I Was Reborn in Naruto as Nara and Uzumaki, Part 1. The protagonist is an accidental time traveler he didn't wait, didn't guess, only dreamed, but ended up in history, which he didn't pay much attention to. He was just lucky with his lineage. Ryo is a new member of the Nara clan, from the Uzumaki lineage on his father's side, and it so happened that he was born not at the beginning of the known plot, but more than three decades and two world wars before. Now he has to figure out how to get out of this situation however he can. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. Well, I said, pushing back from the monitor, tiredly rubbing my eyes and leaning back in my chair. If this isn't Mary Sue territory from the anemia side, then I don't know what qualifies in this manga. After reading the latest chapter of Naruto, I can only marvel at each subsequent increase in the strength of the enemies. Whether it's Pain, who lost solely due to health conditions, or Madara himself with his Mokuten and Rinnegan on top of the eternal Manjikyu Sharingan and God Mode, or Pseudo Madara with his Jido Meizo and a bunch of Biju. And let's not forget about Kabuto, reaching the Sage Mode and Mas Ido Tensei. Against this backdrop, Naruto and his company look downright pale, even with all the power of the latest tail beasts. Ordinary Shinobi, on the other hand, are completely lost somewhere at the bottom. Unless they are at least Jonin. After shutting down the computer, I got up and headed to the kitchen. It was 4 o'clock in the morning, and the two-day marathon of continuous reading of the entire manga was over. Considering that I had only taken short breaks for snacks, it was time to eat properly. Luckily, there were still leftovers in the fridge, enough for a portion and a half. That's what I'll be munching on. Putting the pot on the stove, I lit the burner and waited for 5 minutes. Then, armed with a spoon, I began to fill my stomach, reflecting along the way. If we take the manga plot as true history, rather than the clumsiness and short-sightedness of the mangaka, where some things are embellished, many details are overlooked, and some are simply forgotten, then a large part of the events that have occurred are due to the short-sightedness, self-assurance, and outright stupidity of half of the key characters. Almost like in real life. And I'm not talking about the triviality that emerged after the attack of the fox. Even though they could have trained the students much better, especially the blonde one and the older generation, let's take the same at Chiha who were planning to or rather were planning to start a rebellion. Besides the fact that this story smells bad in general, there are doubts that they started their machinations just like that. This means they were pushed to it. Since for more than half a century before that, the clan lived quite peacefully and without troubles. And who has enough power to suppress the strongest clan in the village, right? The ruling elite from the Hokage and the Council of Elders. The same Danzo always has his own agenda, and could very well carry out an action to eliminate, simply to gain the power of the most powerful Red Eyes, capable of controlling people and Bijuru, and simply eliminate all other owners. After chewing the last spoonful, I licked the sauce off the plate and took the dishes to the sink. Then I'll wash them, and now it's time to sleep. Living alone is quite stressful, but it also has its advantages, especially when the children have grown up and scattered, and you are left alone as a bachelor for the rest of your life. Lying down on the couch and covering myself with a blanket, I couldn't get the plot of the story out of my head. Many consider it child's play. But the quantity and quality of the plotted stories can attract readers of all ages. In fact, thanks to my son's recommendation, I started reading the original, because the series he took to kill time didn't impress me. Except that Kishina looks prettier there. But what a woman. And she was given to an idiot who simply killed her, although he could have prevented such an outcome literally anticipating the actions of likely opponents. What's there to anticipate? Just take her to the hospital. 
not drag her into battle. If only she could have survived after extracting the biju and restraining it during sealing. I'm just so angry. Turning over to the other side, I sighed and settled in more comfortably. There's no point in getting worked up when you can't do anything. It's frustrating. Although, it would be great to be born about two years after the Elder Ino Shika Cho trio let's say in the Nara clan. I always liked them for their characters and lazy charisma, and the theme of their clan techniques is not developed. But there is so much room for imagination let's say. The mother is from the head of the clan's family, and the father's sister is Shikaku. And the second parent should be Yuzumaki. Why not? Considering the nature of the techniques used, the chakra system of the child born will be adapted for almost any direction of shinobi arts ranging from Jinjutsu to Tajutsu with seals. Let's remember the mental abilities of some and the long life and resilience of others, and we get very decent initial data. And let's not forget about the Yuzumaki Keke Genkai. Many may argue that this is heredity and does not fall into this category. But the presence of special chakra like Mito's and Kishina's leads to thoughts. And let's not forget about Karen Yuzumaki, whose chakra is also special along with the abilities of a strong sensor. Nagato, in general, stands out with his dejutsu, and he's also in Yuzumaki. If this is not the presence of a KK Jankai, then I don't know what to call it true. Naruto didn't have anything like that, but as a half-blood with dominant genes from his father which is clearly determined by his appearance. He could only have accelerated regeneration, reinforced by Kurama, and an increased volume of chakra, added to the not small reserves of all the carriers of the tailed beasts. Then it becomes clear how he can produce thousands of clones. Unfortunately, nothing is known about the abilities of the children of female Jinchuriki, due to the absence of these children, except for the most obvious. And even that doesn't tell us what's hereditary and what's inherited from the sealed demon. It seems that one of Tsunade's parents should be like that, but nothing is said about them in the manga. I sighed even adults can dream. To find oneself in a world where almost everything is possible, including resurrecting the dead and creating a human moon, is worth a lot. Surely, the remnants of my life and constant danger in the new one no doubt. It's definitely better than languishing as a sick old man, remembering the best years of life and a bunch of missed opportunities. And what women I've met sigh, and I, fool, was looking for the one and only. Sighing again, I cleared my mind of unnecessary thoughts, and began to plunge into the depths of sleep. And only somewhere far away, barely audible whispers sounded. Just try, not disturbing the sleepy mind of a person about to receive what they desire. The sudden opening of the door, accompanied by loud sounds of a baby's cry bursting into the corridor, made the broad-shouldered man sitting nervously on the bench, in the standard attire of the Waterfall Village Shinobi jump. His luxurious deep red mane, almost burgundy in color, pulled into a tight ponytail at the nape of his neck, left no doubt about the man's affiliation with the renowned Yuzumaki clan. Congratulations, your firstborn has arrived strong and healthy. The middle-aged woman appearing at the threshold in the typical attire of a medic and a Nara clan member announced. However, it was doubtful that anyone else would attend the birth of the clan head's relative. May I, the hesitant happy father stood up and approached the doorway. Until then, the rather dim light in the corridor did not allow determining the man's age. But near the entrance to the room, it became clear that he was quite young around 22 or 3 years old. Of course, come in, but bear in mind that Sei Chan and the baby need rest. The medic reminded sternly, stepping aside. And don't stay too long. Affirmatively nodding. The Yuzumaki tiptoed past her and in an instant, found himself at the bed, where the tired mother lay with the busy baby. Ceasing to cry, he contentedly suckled, attaching himself to his mother's full breast. A true Yuzumaki always finds time to eat. The man murmured affectionately, casting a loving glance at the pair. He even got the hair color from you, let alone the appetite. Sila happily smiled. What shall we name him, Ryuta? Hum, I can't think of one right away. Ryuta cunningly squinted. But maybe if I hold him, something will come to mind. Nara skeptically shook her head, but still detached the sun from her breast. And, despite his disgruntled cries, handed him over to his father. Ryuta carefully took the squalling bundle 
and lifted him above his head, which served as a cessation of the auditory assault, and a curious gaze of little eyes at the unfamiliar red spot nearby. Small hands reached out and began to pat Dad's hair. My little curious dragon, Yuzumaki chuckled, hearing the accompanying grumble from the baby. Ryan Nara, a worthy name for our son, isn't it, sire? Raya, it's a good name. The woman smiled, taking the baby and allowing him to resume his interrupted meal. But why don't you want to name him Raya Yuzumaki? Or Yuzumaki Nara? Well, that would be unfair to you. Ryuta smiled. Sitting on the bed, not only did he inherit my red hair in KK Jenkai, but I named him as well. Taking away his affiliation with your clan would be simply unfair. Thank you. But are you sure he has the Yuzumaki KK Jenkai? Nara became serious, stroking the head of the busy baby, who had fallen asleep during the meal. You know I'm a sensor. The waterfall shinobi shook his head. Even at such a young age, children have chakra that can be felt. And without a doubt, his is almost indistinguishable from the chakra of a pure-blooded Yuzumaki from our family. Almost certainly, my son will be a sensor like me. My grandfather, or my father. Even among the inhabitants of Yuzashiogaka, this is a rare gift, considered a real treasure for any shinobi. I can't say I'm disappointed every mother wants her son to live as long as possible. Saya smiled, stroking the baby who had fallen asleep during the meal. Obvious signs of kinship with the clan of lazy geniuses. But it's better not to let anyone know about it. You have the best senses from the Hayuga clan and some from the Yamanaka. But none of them can travel more than 10 kilometers without additional means. Yuzumaki shook his head. Unfortunately, the tense situation in the political arena doesn't allow me to stay in Kanoha long enough to engage in proper training for Rai. But I'll leave my scrolls with you. When do you have to go back? I doubt I'll stay with you for more than a year or so, Rai sighed. But I'm glad we have at least this time together. Okay. Let's not dwell on the sad, Nara perked up, you and Raya are here, and that's all I need. One year, is it a lot or a little? Well, it depends on how you look at it. If old age is creeping up on you and you're living out the rest of your life, then years fly by like the wind. But if you're just a newborn baby, then a whole year stretches into eternity. You can't speak, you can't walk, you can't even feed yourself. You can't do anything on your own. It's fortunate that humans don't remember their lives from birth. All those swaddling clothes, honesties, and everything else that accompanies all newborn babies. Dreadful. The only bright spot I was briefed, not fed some chemical mixtures that are trendy nowadays. However, my diet wasn't limited to that. Various porridge also diversified my menu which made me literally grow before everyone's eyes. By the end of the year, I was confidently crawling and starting to walk along the wall, not meaning up to the ceiling, just holding onto something with both hands. As a baby, I was calm, didn't cry unnecessarily just out of my infantile pride, and therefore didn't cause my parents any major problems. Of course, there were sometimes worries that someone would notice differences in the behavior of ordinary children, but after eavesdropping on Sai and Raita's conversations, as my father and mother were called, I discovered that I wasn't the only one children of the Nara clan, in general prefer to eat, sleep, and sometimes crawl without wasting energy on extra cries. However, what surprised me wasn't that, but the fact that my cousin Shikaku, at his young age of three, not only ran without problems, but also spoke quite fluently. Damn geniuses. In general, as far as I understood, thanks to the ninja parents, their children developed one and a half to two times faster than civilians, who didn't have large reserves of chakra from birth. Apparently, a greater amount of chakra at birth provided such an opportunity. However, a similar situation was observed among the Nara, but with the Yuzumaki children, they physically developed even faster and by this age began training to become ninja. These are the advantages of having a larger amount of bodily energy. Or, if you remember the fancy names, Yang. If memory serves me right, Yang relates to the degree of physical development, something the inhabitants of the Whirlpool village always had in abundance, while Yin is spiritual development, training of the mind, and gaining experience, something members of the Nara clan had in plenty. Perhaps that's why, with my rather modest knowledge of Japanese, 
I managed to quite decently understand spoken language within half a year. Or maybe it's because Sayo really loved to chat with other moms during my walks. Whether you want it or not, you'll learn something. I tried not to think about the reason for ending up in the world of elemental countries. Indeed, the opportunity to start life anew, crystal clear air, clean water, natural food, and the possibility of gaining powers I hadn't even dreamt of having. Oh, and a rough knowledge of key events that would happen in the future, as well as the ability to influence them. And most importantly, here I have parents, alive. What else do I need? In the old life, I faced an empty apartment after my wife's death, poison in literally everything consumed, and five to ten years until death. Not a very pleasant prospect, and certainly not worth much regret. The second year, significant events outside my limited world were still not observed. But the list of personal achievements grew to include the ability to walk, and later run, speak relatively complex words, and attempt to learn to read and write. The latter was taken on by my dad, who gladly demonstrated magical tricks with seals as a motivational method. For someone who had never seen anything beyond the ordinary in their life, it was truly a miracle. Hence the round eyes and gaping mouth didn't even need to be exaggerated. And anyway, my psyche underwent a series of changes towards simplicity of emotional expression as is typical for children. But it didn't affect the thought process difficulty or worsen concentration. Hail the power of yin as a component of chakra. But all achievements were overshadowed by the presence of my brilliant cousin brother, who by four years old effortlessly wrote characters and played shugi better than many adults not belonging to the Nara clan, much to my envy. He could have trained in Chakra Awakening, but laziness and the habit of sleeping a third of the day greatly interfered with that. The third year, Ryuta could no longer stay with us and return to his village. As Mom said, my grandfather used all his influence to keep him with us for such a long time. I wonder which of the two. Two and a half years is much more than 12 months. Despite such a sad event, I have reason to be proud alongside a huge expansion of my vocabulary. I mastered writing at a level sufficient to engage in seal drawing. I made my first seal under my dad's supervision just before he left. Shikaku is taking a break I'm a genius. Although, I only awakened my chakra at the very end of the year under mom's strict supervision, so I didn't get to fill that same seal personally. And besides the training seal that emits light, I couldn't draw anything else. Dad left clear instructions to start practicing Fuenjutsu only at the age of four, and only after achieving good chakra control. By that time, my chakra volume should have increased to the level of an average ninja academy student. That's why I had to spend a month meditating, trying to feel the chakra inside me. As Mom explained, Yuzumaki are forced to start training at this age, due to the significantly large chakra volumes even in childhood, and if they don't start two years earlier than everyone else, there will be big problems with control. Moreover, if you deplete the reserve almost completely, the volume will increase much faster than naturally. Well, who would object? I'm always happy to do something just because the list of entertainments is extremely short here. For example, I like to chase our shepherd dogs, which are used to drive deer in the Nara forest. It really develops muscles and overall body speed. A kind of preparation for future training, you could say. Well, I also train in fast writing, which is also very useful for a future seal master. I play shogi with mom, and that's it. There's nothing else to do, except maybe sleep or stare at the clouds, like my cousin brother does. Even TVs here are not used as entertainment devices but as surveillance devices for monitoring the territory through cameras or recording important events, and they are very expensive. There's no television or radio at all. Communication is used exclusively for military purposes and even then over short distances. How did I find out? I visited the clan library. I didn't find anything interesting, but I managed to borrow a couple of books. One of them turned out to be historical and described the wanderings of one of the Nara during the clan wars before the founding of the first villages. It was very interesting like reading an uncensored action movie. Now I understand how ancient shinobi entertained themselves first, a good fight, and then interrogating surviving men to extract known techniques, and using enemy kinoichi for the same purposes. The latter broke faster. I quickly returned the historical book before anyone caught me. I feel like if I were caught with it, 
My ears would definitely be torn off. But I remembered where I put it very well. I'll have to sneak it to Shikaku in a year. Maybe after reading it, he'll stop being so lazy with training. In the same year, I met Yamanaka Anochi and Akimichi Chauza, as well as their fathers. Well, met is not entirely accurate. I saw them from Ashara's knees. My grandfather who retired and handed over the reins of the clan to his son. The old man never lost hope in me and constantly talked about the times of his youth, literally instilling a desire to become a shinobi. Given that most of the adventures happened before the formation of Kanoha, it was terribly interesting, because nothing like this was even mentioned in the manga. Who would have thought that the Inuzuka were once a shepherd clan? What's even funnier, while Mom wasn't around, he showed me hand seals, taking a promise not to tell anyone. Anyway, I got distracted. The blonde and the chubby brought their children to meet Shikaku. Apparently, even before the famous Ino Shikacho formation, our clans were friendly with each other. But it was funny to think that I was present at the birth of the Heroes of the Future War. And if Akamichi and Nara in childhood looked almost like exact copies of their future sons, Inochi looked more like a girl with his long hair, especially since he hadn't tied it up yet. By the way, I already started to tidy up my overgrown fiery red mane myself, and even sometimes braided it tightly with mom's help, so that it wouldn't stick out in all directions. It turned out almost as thick as my arm. You can clearly see whose hair I inherited, it's exactly the same as Ryuta's. And the most important event along with increasing chakra control. I awaken the gift of sensing. At least, that's what mom explained when I asked why I could feel the presence of chakra of varying intensity in people nearby. Over time, memories of my past life began to fade and dim, like the contents of a red book. It evokes some emotions, but only as if from a red story. No more. And who's waiting for me there anyway? My wife is dead, my children have long been independent and only occasionally visit. Of course, 60 isn't the end of life. But the best years have passed. No, there's no regret. And when you start to realize the possibilities opening up ahead, doubts no longer bother you. It's much more interesting here. The fourth year, a sad year. But let's start from the beginning. I have achieved considerable success in my training, especially in chakra control, approximately at the level of an average genin. But even that is a huge achievement, considering that my reserves are equal to those of an experienced Chunin. At least that's what Ma says, and she can be trusted. After all, she's a retired Jonin. She doesn't go on missions, but she maintains her form. Of course, not every Yuzumaki has as much, at least, I think so. But that's exactly what I aimed for, especially with some help. On my third birthday, Grandpa gave me a special shirt woven with fine chakra conducting wire, just like the vests worn by elite Jonin. Just charge it with chakra, and you get an impenetrable barrier against any metal and most weak ES rank techniques. It's terribly expensive, but if you use it constantly, not only does your reserve and control increase, but the chakra channels of the upper half of the body and arms up to the fingertips also develop contributing to the overall strengthening of these body parts. It's a pity such pants aren't sold, but I think with more practice walking on walls, this shortcoming will be addressed. As my control grew, so did the distance at which I could sense chakra users from a couple dozen meters, it increased to a hundred. Unfortunately, this brought problems too if someone with a larger reserve was nearby. My senses would start to blur, making it impossible to detect those further away. According to Dad's notes, it took me about three months of continuous training to overcome this problem and learn to block targets with too large a reserve. In the same year, I finally started learning the basics of clan techniques with the other three-year-olds. Well, only the theory. The practical part comes a year later. Shikaki has already started complaining about the complexity, constant fatigue, and unwillingness to become a shinobi. However, that's until his mom Sitsuri or Sai is nearby. Otherwise, the scolding that follows quickly shows the fallacy of such an opinion. As it turns out, the basis of Nara clan techniques lies in yin energy. Yes, just like in most Jinjutsu. Actually, shadow manipulation can be somewhat called an illusion. Direct manipulation of our chakra is somewhat similar to the chains used by Kishina, except she uses physical strength, not intellect. In any case, if we rely on the accuracy of the manga, 
So, in the classes, the principle of usage was explained, control was trained, which is absolutely necessary for all Nara. And attempts were made to isolate this very yin component of chakra. From what I've asked the teaching members of the clan, this kind of preparation takes about two to three years on average, and by the age of six or seven, you can start learning shadow jutsu yourself. First with the simplest manipulations to get used to it and gain experience, and then with more complex ones. I stopped my physical training disguised as games. The reason is simple Saya started training with me in this direction. Well, the training was disguised as games. Increasing endurance, speed, and strength was the main focus. And all this without chakra. The strangest thing is that it's much easier than in my previous life. The famous Yuzumaki endurance. Most likely, but the workload keeps increasing. And if before I ate for two, now the amount of food consumed has doubled again. However, Ma is just happy to cook more she found shadow clones in the scrolls left by dad. And now fully utilizes the technique. Sending them to cook, clean, and wash her copies. It's a pity I haven't managed to get my hands on such a useful jutsu yet. Interestingly, she started training even more, and there's a certain tension in the air. According to some overheard phrases and recalling the chronology, I managed to recognize the proximity of the Second World War. Confirmation of this was a conversation overheard between Uncle Shinesu, who held the post of Chief Strategist and Commander of the Jonin in the village, and his subordinate. Of course, if I were an enemy spy, they would have noticed me having nothing to do, but who would pay attention to children playing in the neighboring room, the elder of whom isn't even six yet, and the younger one is four. And it's lucky that I've already learned to direct chakra to my ears, enhancing my already naturally good hearing. In general, they talked about many things, but the main thing I highlighted was this. According to intelligence reports, Kurigaka and Kumogaka have started rapidly increasing their military power and gradually increasing their border garrisons. Analysts believe that with a 90% probability, these advancements signify the imminent start of a new war and it's quite possible that both sides will want to eliminate Yuzashiogaka from the global equation just to acquire the famous Yuzumaki techniques, accumulated wealth, and artifacts over centuries, as well as to eliminate Leaf's reliable ally. Only a few know about this for now, but already the Hokage and the Elders are discussing the futility of sending aid to allies, a necessary sacrifice for the village's survival. Kanoha hasn't fully recovered from the First Shinobi World War, and therefore losing forces in the impending Suno Iwa War, in which Kanoha might have to get involved as well, is not advisable, and exposes the village to unnecessary risk. Furthermore, Danzo has stirred with his root. Uncle's conversation partner speculated that he hopes to snatch a piece of Yuzumaki knowledge and treasures before the two great villages take everything for themselves. So to speak, a platform for the emerging organization. And maybe he'll act alongside them. His hatred for Mito Yuzumaki is well known, as is his persistent desire to get his hands on the knowledge of sealing masters and barriers. The first's wife gave him a good beating when he tried to pry into her library, and even refused her husband's training, thus harboring future resentment. And it's not just him Orochimaru is also keen on getting his hands on the knowledge of generations of Yuzumaki, regardless of the number of casualties. Apparently, even at such a young age, the future Snake Sanin was distinguished by considerable cold-bloodedness and cynicism. And considering that he has carried out espionage missions against this elder, despite being a student of Saratobi, the picture painted was quite dark. After such a conversation, it became clear how Yuzashi Ogaka was destroyed probably not without betrayal from Kanoa's side. If the attack wasn't carried out by a shinobi, under the guise of friendly visits. And as if this news wasn't bad enough, closer to my fourth birthday came the news of Ryuta's death. Mom reread the letter marked with the red whirlpool symbol for a long time, and suddenly she seemed to age 10 years. The spark disappeared from her eyes, and her hands helplessly dropped. She sat like that until I climbed onto her lap and hugged her, burying my face in her chest. After that, we sat like that until late in the evening and then into the morning, embracing each other. And only when dawn broke, I was told that as soon as I turned four, we would go visit my second grandfather from dad's side. Actually, this event was the catalyst for changing history, but I understood that much later. However, I don't regret it at all after all. 
That's why I wanted to be born long before the original manga storyline began to unfold. And finally, the long-awaited day has come today my mom and I are going to visit my grandpa Yuzumaki. In preparation for this, I've thoroughly prepared for the journey. The sets of kunai and shuriken given to me beforehand, a jacket sized for me resembling those worn by Chunin, and the beloved shirt from Grandpa, as well as a field kit of medical supplies, all helped me with this. However, what other gifts can you expect a child from the Nara clan strategists, medics, and assassins? Perhaps only a set for playing shogi, but I received that earlier. Despite our clan being a clan of hereditary professional assassins, the training of youth, starting from the age of three, is set up very properly. From childhood, all future shinobi and kinochi are instilled with a very healthy outlook on life, strangely called the philosophy of survival here. Its essence is simple death is a natural cycle of life, and is not something unnatural. Just as predators fight for territory in the cycle of nature and the weak perish, shinobi act in a similar manner. To this, we add God's reincarnation and a bit of philosophy. Of course, this is a simplified version, but the fact that children's minds are prepared for future losses and killings in the chosen profession cannot fail to command respect. If you think about it sensibly, it is for this reason that members of clans are the best shinobi in terms of intellect, unlike those who went to study at the academy without any initial foundational principles influencing a child's overall growth. Take the Sanin for example, two out of three have their quirks, and the last one decided to drown her sorrow over her destroyed clan and family in Seiken gambling dens. Or the brightest example Naruto himself and Sakura. If the former always relied on natural charisma and the bonuses of being a Jinchuriki rather than skills, then the latter, no matter how she tried, was not suited for the chosen profession until Tsune took her under her wing. And they were lucky enough to live long enough, gaining experience and getting more or less normal teachers. If we recall the impending war, it is the ordinary citizens who will be expendable as in the Second World War and in the Third, simply because more prepared shinobi can wriggle out of many troubles where others will lose their heads and not fall into black despair over it. It is also worth not forgetting the transmission of accumulated experience from veterans to the young generation. The leaders of the Nara's training sessions are mostly in a respectable age for assassins, after three or four decades of service. I think the quite idiotic idea of peace in the whole world that Jiraiya was enthusiastic about and infected Minato with at the time, and then Naruto, has the same roots. All three grew up in an orphanage, and that definitely left its mark. If you think sensibly, through the wars, shinobi undergo a natural selection of the strongest, and trying to remove the foundation of the current world system, both military and financial, would only occur to an idiot or an idealist. However, these two words don't differ much in meaning. It has always surprised me that the fourth, who practically single-handedly ended the Third World War, can maintain such a naive view of the world. Or did the war affect him so much? Raya, are you ready soon? Say peeks into the room fully equipped. Yes, Kar Chan, I'm ready. After checking the attachments of the pouch with kunai and shuriken one last time, I was convinced of my readiness. Then let's go. The hired teams are already waiting at the quarter gates. Nodding. I ran out of my room to the exit following my mom. We lived in a small one-story house on the outskirts of the main complex of clan buildings. Generally, although I hadn't ventured out of the Nara's territory into Kanoha itself yet, I had the opportunity to appreciate the architectural style of the clan as over a considerable territory of several hectares. One could walk calmly without fearing anything. And despite Kanoha's positioning as a city, the extensive lands belonging to the clans, I was curious about the others too. Actually looked like country estates with cottages, except for the almost palatial residences of the clan heads. Of course, this doesn't apply to the Hayuga and Ichiha, due to their habit of living cohesively. Around our house, there was a small fruit garden, and a little further away, a small vegetable patch. Obviously, regardless of the world, there will always be people who love to dig in the soil and grow something of their own even if those people have chosen the profession of assassins. As for the style of construction traditional Japanese houses of the old style, from the 17th to the 18th century, only due to the abundance of wood around paper sliding walls were replaced with thin wooden ones. The heat reigning in the land of fire in summer, and the mild snowless winter with temperatures above 10 degrees, demanded good ventilation for comfortable living. 
Of course, such openness required appropriate security measures. But the presence of a real master of seals and barriers nearby allows for real wonders. So the protective barrier and various seals protecting our house, the exact purpose of which I didn't even hope to understand in the next couple of years, turned it into a real fortress. However, such a picture applied not only to our house, practically the entire Naira clan took advantage of the opportunity to strengthen their homes. And my uncle even significantly replenished the clan's repository with various seals. And all this was paid for with hefty ryos. More precisely, with hundreds of thousands. And all this money pa left to us. You could say we're rich. That's why my mom can still afford not to return to the ranks of shinobi, risking leaving me an orphan. So, Ryu-chan, listen to me carefully. Waiting for me to put on my sandals, Saya took me by the hand, and, leading me out of the house, activated the barrier. We are leaving Kanoha now and will travel through the land of fire towards Yazushiogaku no Sato, where your second grandfather lives. Understand? Yes, Ka-chan. I nodded patiently awaiting her continuation as we walked towards the exit from the Nara Quarter. Excellent. We won't be traveling on foot like ordinary townsfolk, but through the trees, like all shinobi. As our mentors showed us, we had already been shown this method of chakra control among others. But we hadn't learned to use it yet. But I still don't know how. No, my little one. Saida laughed softly, bending down and picking me up in her arms. You don't need to run like a shinobi. I'll carry you on my back. The whole way. Won't you get tired? No, Ryo-chan. I'm very strong and can carry you for much longer than a couple of days. Mom smiled. And now, something serious. You've never left Kanoha and the clan's territory. And you don't know that the outside world is very dangerous even for shinobi. That's why my father hired one team for our protection, and I hired another. So if we're attacked, we'll be protected. Got it. I nodded. You're so smart. Mom smiled, rubbing her cheek against my hair. Ka-chan. I already know that. Ah, yes. What was I talking about, oh yes. In case enemy shinobi attack us. I want you to continuously maintain the flow of chakra to your shirt. Sayo looked me seriously in the eyes. Anything can happen in battle. And it's better to be prepared for surprises. Also, during the journey, you must remember the feeling of chakra from each of our companions. And if anyone unfamiliar tries to approach us without our knowledge, you must inform me or any shinobi who is closer to you. I'll try. If you promise that as soon as we return, you'll allow me to train in fuinjutsu. I grinned happily. Oh, you little trickster. After patting me on the cheek, Mom nodded. I promise. And most importantly, when I tell you to close your eyes, you'll do it without any questions. And only open them when I allow it. Got it. Got it. She cares so much about me. Overwhelmed by the feeling of happiness and such care, I hugged Sila tighter around the neck and buried myself in her loose hair, which fell freely to her shoulders. How nice it is to be so deeply loved. And whatever happens, don't leave my side for a moment. If you suddenly want something, tell me, and we'll decide together what can be done. Do you understand everything? Yes. Not to leave your side. Close my eyes and talk about strangers. I repeated all of Mom's instructions. Good job, Raishan. By the end of the briefing, we reached the gates where I had long noticed the presence of two strong sources of chakra, one of which turned out to be stronger than I had ever felt, and six weaker ones, including the usual Nara Chunin, serving as guards at the entrance to the territory. Seeing us, they quickly opened a small door in the gates, first weakening the seal protection, and let us out onto the street. Here comes our employer, one of the nearby station shinobi remarked. Turning around, I began to examine the first shinobi I encountered, who served Kanoha, and did not belong to our clan or allies. In general, all eight of our protectors wore standard gear for Chunin and Jonin, not much different from what Mom wore. The six teenage Chunin boys looked completely ordinary, and the only one who stood out was a member of the Inyazuka clan. Thanks to his tattoos and a large dog, more like a wolf, which reached up to his mid-thigh. The most peculiar thing was that, besides the slight Asian features expressed in slightly slanted eyes and slightly thinner facial features, the people here didn't resemble Japanese at all, and certainly weren't as small. A group of such guys would be almost commonplace on the streets of our city. Only their graceful movements, indicative of intensified martial arts training, set them apart. 
As for the Jonin, they warranted closer inspection. One didn't differ much from the others, except for his straight black hair, which literally shimmered blue in the sunlight, and his eyes, completely without pupils, were a white silvery color. Aha, uh Iga. -huh, his rank counterpart presented a more exotic sight at all. Very beautiful, shapely woman in her early 20s, with piercing green eyes and luxurious red hair. The first time I've seen a color other than my father's red hair. Dark brown, or black typical of all in our clan, or the blonde heads of the Yamanaka. I wonder what other colors I'll come across. It would be cool to see pink or green. That's something you don't see in everyday life. Behind the beauty, the hilt of a sword protruded, the size of which exceeded my height two or even three times. Well, she's quite a character. If I were a dozen or so years older, I'd definitely be drooling metaphorically speaking. Right now, I just glanced at it with a curious gaze, and returned to the representative of one of Kanoha's strongest clans. Good day, Nara-san. My name is Yoshi Hayuga. And this is Linley Senja. We and our teams will be your escort. I am the mission commander for the time being. Senju, almost wiped out clan, the last representative of which will be Tsunade. Now, it's clear why she has such a large chakra volume almost twice as much as the other Jonin, and three times as much as Mom. Better not to think about myself and the Chunin at all. Apparently, they haven't been knocked out enough yet that there's no one left. Well, right, since the village's foundation, there's only been one war, most of which was led by Toborama. And he wouldn't use his clan as cannon fodder and block dangerous directions with almost guaranteed lethal outcomes. It was later that Saratobi nearly completely wiped out the founding clan. Seeing that I was examining her intently, Senju warmly smiled and winked at me. I smiled widely and waved back, receiving in return for my efforts a quiet melodic laughter. I like him, exclaimed the beauty, almost ignoring the surprise of those around her. What's your name? Rai. Pleasure to meet you, Rai Chan. Pleasure to meet you, Linley Chan. I like you too, a true gentleman, laughed Linley. Simple and straightforward, not all how about spending the evening together or allow me to invite you to dinner and the like. Now Saya was already laughing with a characteristic intonation, as if the two of them knew some joke, and everyone else caught on and busily looked at the ground or around, deliberately avoiding making eye contact with the two Kyunoichi, which only amused them even more. The only one who remained cool was Hayiga, but if you looked very closely, you could see the faintest hint of a blush on his face. I wonder, does such a reaction mean that each of the present shinobi tried in one way or another to hit on Senju? I can't blame them, she's definitely one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen. I think even the acknowledged beauty Tsunade somewhat loses to her relative, judging by the photos I've seen of the current heads of clans and their heirs. Studying allied and friendly clans is part of a young shinobi's training, just like learning manners. Thank goodness. The Naras are too lazy to really bother with that. Ahem, the possessor of the Byakugan drew attention to himself. If you're ready, we can start, and we can talk on the way. Of course, Hayuga-san, Mom slightly bowed, we are ready. Then let's proceed to the gates. Do you prefer to walk on the ground, or shall we move in a faster way? Don't worry, I'll keep up with you just fine. Saya replied, adjusting her grip on me for comfort. We reached the gates by leaping across rooftops. And honestly, I didn't think a person could develop such speed. A vehicle, sure, but not on foot. Everything around was flashing by so quickly that I couldn't make out the details, turning my head from side to side. It may seem easy to move like this from the outside, but in reality, the oncoming wind stings the eyes, and distinguishing where exactly to jump is not so simple, not to mention the considerable height. So I hung onto Mom's back like a sack of potatoes, clutching her neck tightly and trying not to stick out. We reached the gates literally in a couple of minutes, and considering that it takes about two hours to walk through the village, the capabilities of Shinobi command respect. The need for any means of transportation like cars just disappears. Well, thank goodness. At least the air is clean, and nature is unpolluted. That alone outweighs all the downsides of this world. Stopping for a couple of minutes, we had our papers checked by the four Chunin on guard duty, one of whom was a member of the Hayuga clan, and then we left Kanoa. Nara-san, as we rounded the massive wall protecting the village, 
The squad leader moved closer to us, while the Chunin formed a neat box around us two in front, two behind, and two on the sides. Yes, Hayuga san before I decide on a route, I would like to know if you prefer to camp under a roof, or if camping in the forest wouldn't be a problem. Mom threw a quick questioning glance at me. In the forest, I replied without hesitation. One might wonder why we brought scrolls with sealed tents and futons, if we were going to stay in hotels. Excellent. Then we'll head west in a straight line to Khan, without detouring to settlements for overnight stays. The Jonin nodded and, with a small burst of chakra, moved to the front of the squad. After running through the open space before the walls, we plunged into the forest and the nightmare began. If I thought it was scary to move across rooftops some time ago, that was just child's play compared to this. The trees here resembled thousand-year-old baobabs that even five people couldn't wrap their arms around, and the lowest branches were about 20 meters above the ground. Running up the trunks, the shinobi jumped onto them, gradually climbing higher. Soon, the ground below started to seem very far away, and only by sheer force of will did I suppress the fear of heights. That began to creep up, but even that wasn't the worst part moving at such speed as a passenger. I simply couldn't keep up with all the branches coming towards us, and I was constantly afraid that we would crash into one of them at full speed. I had to look around to avoid getting myself unnecessarily worked up. Another problem was the jumps from branch to branch the contents of my stomach kept rising to my throat at the peak only to fall back down when we landed on the next tree. Of course, the movement was smooth, without sharp jolts, but the constant up-down motion made me quite queasy. Luckily, I managed to start circulating chakra rapidly in my body in time, miraculously avoiding the embarrassment of regurgitating half-digested food in front of everyone. I wouldn't want to disgrace myself like that in front of everyone. After a couple of hours, somewhat getting used to this mode of transportation, I simply closed my eyes and soon felt myself drifting off to sleep. The whole day had passed uneventfully and rather monotonously, except for Hayuga activating his Byakugan. Nothing interesting, just veins appearing on his temples and around his eyes, and the eyes themselves beginning to glow slightly from the excess chakra in the Dejutsu. The squad made several stops to eat and take care of necessary matters, after which the movement resumed. In principle, all journeys should go like this fast boring and without traffic jams. Even normal conversation could only be done through hand gestures. But since I hadn't learned them yet, Mom's hands were busy, and the rest were vigilantly guarding us or pretending to, just as bored as I was. I could only watch the shinobi and doze off. As evening fell and the last rays of the sun disappeared, we stopped for the night in a small clearing. In general, the whole forest of the fire country was somewhat ornamental, too well maintained. There were not many bushes and brushwood, the grass between the trees was knee high to me, and there was no presence of weeds, so familiar to the eyeing garden plots and vegetable gardens. It felt as if the whole country used to consist of meadows, and then someone took and grew a thousand-year-old forest. The rumor that Hashirama Senju had grown all the forests of the fire country in a couple of steps was true. And most importantly, cutting down one of these trees is enough to produce tons of wood. No one here would cut down forests just for export. My mother had brought a big two-person tent for the night, and thanks to the ceiling scrolls, we didn't even have to put it up, it was enough to print it out. The Chunins looked at us with envy as they pulled sleeping bags out of their backpacks. Hey, someday I'll know how to make such things. The Jounin were not much different from them, with the only difference being that their camping gear was sealed in small palm-sized scrolls, while ours was elbow long, and contained not only a tent, but a bunch of other stuff as well. Despite Kanoha's alliance with Yuzashio, the various products of Seal Masters were expensive, and not every shinobi could afford anything other than explosive seals and simple sealing scrolls. After a quick meal, the Jonans distributed the order of duty at night among their wards, and we went to bed. My mom, after a little banter with Linley, suggested that she spend the night with us. I wasn't even close to being an adult, so the three of us all fit in without any problems. Two futons were moved closer together, with me in the middle and Senju and Saya on either side of me. I had a chance to look at Linley's ample bust, and she had a great figure, especially in black lingerie. It was a man's dream, because when I changed into my nightclothes, I was shown almost everything but the most important thing. Yeah, 
I was about to get a nosebleed maybe. But I was indifferent first of all. I'd been sleeping with my mother half the time for the past few months, since Ryuta's death had affected her a lot, and she was trying to keep me in sight. Secondly, when you'd been breastfeeding for over a year, you got used to seeing that part of a woman's body. So I didn't see anything new. And thirdly, when you were four years old, breasts attracted you only as a pillow and didn't evoke any other feelings, no matter how much experience you'd had. So I let myself change into my favorite pajamas with an adorable cap in the form of a deer with antlers. I snuggled up to my mom and fell asleep quickly. I woke up to something heavy piled on top of me, preventing me from breathing freely, grumbling unhappily. I opened my eyes and tried to look around. The key word was tried because I failed. When I got out of the sleepy fog that filled my head, I found that the sleeping positions in the tent had changed overnight, and I was now being used as a pylon for the Jonin, who was pressing her breasts down on top of me. Let's not forget the fact that I was being squeezed by the arms of the same brazen kunochi wrapped around my breasts, and my legs were pressed against her pelvis, preventing any movement. Beautiful, just beautiful. Trying to twist away, I only succeeded in making the embrace tighter. Puffing a little from the effort, I stopped and thought about how I could get out of this awkward position, but I had to stop when I heard a stifled chuckle from the side. Puffing, I managed to move my head sideways and turned it to look to the right. I was not at all pleased with the picture. Not at all. What I saw was my mom choking on laughter, biting her knuckle and trying to make as little sound as possible. It worked only until she saw my indignant face. Then the trader burst into laughter and started rolling around on the feet and holding her stomach. She was watching my agony. Ash Car Chan, but my attempt to appeal to my parents' conscience did not succeed, only generating a new wave of fun. As I puffed up, I mumbled to myself about the unfairness of life and the insolent senju who unabashedly use others as their pylons while trying to strangle them. Unfortunately, being pinned down by three or four times your body weight wasn't much of an outrage, but I could hide the smile that crept onto my face at the sound of such gleeful and sincere laughter. It's at times like this that I realize how young Sila still is 22 years old, and for a shinobi that's considered the middle of life, it's all the more gratifying that she's still laughing so happily even after her father's death. The whole commotion finally woke Senju up, and without letting go of me, she started to complain that she couldn't sleep properly. By the way, others also want to sleep long when they're not squeezed like soft toys, and not used as pillows. I grumbled indignantly from under her. At first, Linley froze, obviously only then realizing that she was hugging someone, and then she lifted herself slightly, and glanced at my outraged face. What a cutie. If there was still hope in my head that I would be released immediately, it was buried with this exclamation. They started squeezing me again, and no protests or resistance could interrupt this process. Lord, do all women experience such weakness towards beautiful children? Shikaku, for example, isn't squeezed by anyone, including his mother, while both of them gladly squeeze me, as well as almost every acquaintance who comes to visit us. Not that it happens often. Or is it just the color of my hair? Dear reader, I kindly ask you to actively rate the book and leave comments. Ka-chan, stop lazing around there trying to strangle me here. And you're just laughing. I tried to appeal to Sai's conscience, but only provoked a new wave of amusement. Kami, thanks to you that the tent walls are sealed with seals that don't let sound out, and also prevent peeking inside with the Hayuga Dejutsu. Otherwise, my embarrassment would become the whole squad's affair. Not to mention that I really don't want curious people to see this annoying pair of Kunochi in their nightwear. After a while, they calmed down, and I was released. True, that didn't stop me from sulking, but according to the giggling couple, it made me even cuter. Ugh, darn it. Since dawn was almost breaking, we decided to get up instead of lounging around. I dressed myself, firmly refusing any help, earning myself a couple of smiles. So, when we emerged from the tent, facing us were two smiling women and one disgruntled me quietly grumbling about the unfairness of life. Moving away from the couple just in case, I sat on a small stump, adapted as a seat since yesterday, and tried not to pay attention to their whispers and quiet giggles. Thank goodness I can't hear them, otherwise, I'd be as red as a tomato for some reason. Moms love to share stories about their children's most embarrassing moments. The other shinobi cast curious glances away, 
but silently collected their sleeping gear and prepared for breakfast. Catching one of the dissatisfied glances thrown their way, Senju stifled a laugh with her palm, quietly listening to what Ma was whispering to her. Growing even more irritated and intensifying my gaze, I decided it was time for a little payback. And there'll be a celebration on my street. Stop giggling. Next time you decide to squeeze someone squeeze each other. And no attempts to use me as a pillow or to suffocate me with your chest, especially if it's of such size. And if you think it's pleasant, you're mistaken. I accompanied my angry tirade with shaking fists well, childish fist, undoubtedly adding considerable comicality to the action. The effect was impressive. One Chunin, returning with a handful of branches for breakfast cooking, dropped his load and got a wooden smack on the leg. The other, just gathering his sleeping bag, missed the roll and gracefully toppled headfirst into the ground. Another, sitting on the ground and sorting through his supply of projectiles, dropped a kunai and nearly lost his main asset when it embedded a few millimeters from his trousers. The rest of the chunin began to blush rapidly, and Hayuga almost spilled his tea, pouring it into a cup from a small thermos. A, not quite the result I was aiming for, but it'll do. The main thing is that the sweet couple is not laughing at me anymore. Though they try to conceal their laughter as coughing, even a fool could see through it. So, that's how our morning began, full of fun. After a quick breakfast, we gathered our things and were on the move again in a couple of minutes. Though this time, it was Senju who volunteered to carry me. But it didn't make much difference. The second day of the journey turned out to be a mirror image of the past until Hayuga activated his Bayakigan once again and almost immediately ordered the squad to stop. What's happened? Senju immediately asked, seeing the Jonin's face more serious than usual. Seven shinobi are approaching us from the right, all bearing the Karigaka headbands. They're definitely coming towards us, not just passing by. Definitely. When we stopped, they changed their course straight towards us. Not to the point where we could have been, continue moving at the same speed. This group is targeting us. Dear reader, I kindly ask you to actively rate the book and leave comments. Damn it. We need to find a suitable place for the meeting. We won't have time to prepare a proper ambush. But we should set up a few traps. To the left of us, there's a large clearing where there'll be enough space for maneuvering to use strong techniques, replied Hyuga. Quickly, let's head there. There are only seven opponents. Three of them are at the level of a middle jonin. The rest are experienced chunin. Judging by the behavior and movements of our opponents, three of them are used to acting as a team, while the others are loners. How many ninjutsu specialists? Asked Linley as a group jumped through the trees in the required direction, one of her students leaving behind disguised explosive tags, masking them with illusions. Of course, it's just my assumption, but the fact that the explosive tags disappeared right before our eyes, blending in with the bark, only supported the assumption. 3. Plus, one medic or jinjutsu specialist, and the rest are likely tojutsu users. They all have tantos with them, but Karigaka shinobi don't use tantos, exclaimed the jonin. We'll worry about that later, the commander cut in. When you're fighting, be cautious one of them just disappeared underground and is still moving in our direction. Karigaka knows Doton. Mal whispered in surprise. There's something fishy here leaping into the open space. Our squad ran a bit further and then stopped, forming a semicircle placing obvious close combat fighters in the center and positioning everyone else on the sides, except for Senju, who stayed a step away from us. Ma handed me over at the first sign of danger. Senju-san will handle the main battle, and you cover the clients and support from a distance, acting as a reserve if needed. Understood. Team, stick together and demonstrate everything I've taught you. Yes, Sensei. You know what to do, nodded their jonin. Attention, they'll appear any moment. If possible, let's try to avoid a fight. But at the first sign of threat, aim for incapacitation. Just as he finished speaking, I started feeling the approaching shinobi, both above in the trees and below in the ground. In Yazuka's dog quietly growled and tensed up. Unexpectedly for me, there was a sudden burst of chakra, followed by an explosion, then another one, merging into a continuous barrage. After one of the explosions, the closest chakra source to it stopped and began to weaken. We got one, blew off a leg with an explosive tag. Yoshi punched his palm triumphantly, giving a stern look to Hayuga. Mara encouragingly squeezed my hand, then whispered, Raya-chan, 
Can you hang on to me by yourself without support? I'll need my hands free just in case. Nodding. I pulled myself up a bit on my arms and wrapped my legs around her waist at abdomen level, mentally praising the physical exercises that had started, including stretching and the fact that Saya kept herself fit. And wasn't too heavy thanks to this, even a four-year-old like me could comfortably wrap my legs around her slender waist. Locking my legs, I made sure I held securely as Ma withdrew her hands, and lightly jumped to check. I held steady. Great. And don't forget the rules. Yes, Ka Chan. While we exchanged a couple of phrases, our pursuers caught up with us and landed on the other side of the clearing. And judging by the slight hesitation, they expected fewer of us. So, their sensor can only distinguish the presence of Chakra nearby, but not the number and strength of each shinobi. Who are you, and why are you chasing us? Hayuga took advantage of the pause. Karigaka has no business in the Land of Fire's territory, so you'd better leave peacefully, or else your village will be held responsible for the consequences. It's strange that he started a conversation instead of immediately attacking. Or is he just afraid to initiate a conflict between villages? But his little speech didn't make an impression on our enemies. The one who felt the strongest pulled two pieces of paper out of his pocket, glanced quickly in our direction, and nodded. Senju and Yuzumaki take alive, kill the rest, ordered the enemy leader. And this phrase signaled the start of the battle. Ryu, eyes. Ma commanded, taking a kunai in each hand and crouching slightly, spreading her legs a bit wider, ready to jump in any direction. I closed my eyes and immediately began to infuse my shirt with chakra. I couldn't see the entire battle, but I doubted that my eyes at my age could keep up with the speed of an ordinary chunin, so I had to rely on my senses and my hearing. However, the sounds of blows, the clinking of weapons, and other signs of battle nearby were interrupted every few seconds by explosions and waves of hot air. Ash Rin. Damn it. Senju cursed at the same time as another painful cry, and with a small burst of chakra she simply disappeared, appearing in the middle of the fight. Ash Katen. Kobu. Ash Gitsuga. Ash Doto. Baba. Along with the flashes of chakra from the fight that almost blinded my senses, the names of the techniques and the complete absence of water techniques, while even one of Raten's was used, made me seriously worried Kiri Shinobi mostly used big swords and water techniques, but not fire or earth techniques. Trying to make sense of what was going on around us, I somehow lost sight of the seventh Shinobi using the dive, and ended up noticing another source of chakra under my feet until we were about five meters away. Ash underneath us. Ash, I almost shrieked, instantly becoming covered in a cold sweat of fear. Fortunately, Ma reacted instantly, jumping back and beginning to fold the seals. Ash Katen. Eridan. Heat blazed in my face, and a fire technique flew straight into the spot we were just in. And right into the flames came a shinobi who hadn't had time to deal with the change of scenery. The shriek of frantic pain was quickly cut short when the explosion occurred. The smell of burning meat almost made me empty my stomach, but with a monstrous effort of will, I swallowed and tried to ignore it, not immediately realizing that the sounds were beginning to fade. Ash Katen, with a dome of chakra that was almost palpable to me, the last two enemy shinobi fell out of formation and silence fell, interrupted only by a couple of thuds and groans. There were a few barely audible sounds, as if the weapons had been driven into something, and only a squad was left alive. Two of the Chunin were seriously wounded from the chakra fluctuations, but judging by the use of healing techniques and the fact that their condition was gradually improving, there was no need to worry about the consequences. Ash Ka Chan, can I open my eyes? Dash, I asked quietly, still clinging to my mother's back and maintaining my protection. Ash, wait a bit. My good one, now we'll move away from here, and only then I'll let you look around. Silas stroked my head. Ash, did you find anything? Ash, I heard Senju's voice. Dash, no, just the standard mission gear. A couple of paralyzing seals for the prisoners, and nothing else. Not even personal belongings. Hayuga said, just pictures of you and the baby. It's obvious you were the targets, and my team was not the one the attackers were expecting to see. Dash damn, someone must have ratted us out if the attackers knew when and where their targets were going, Linley almost growled. Ash, seal the bodies and get out of here before anyone else shows up. 
After waiting for us to move away from the battlefield, I stopped the chakra flow. Pleased to see that the total supply hadn't decreased much, opened my eyes, and had a chance to assess the damage done to our side. The Chunin were relatively intact, save for some scratches and scorches on their clothes. But almost all of the Chunin looked like they'd been put through a meat grinder, and then tried to fry. One of them was holding his whipped arm, and Inuzuka was holding his right side. His Ninkan looked the most intact but a few bloodstains near its mouth and on its paws showed that it too had contributed to the overall victory. Ash, I don't like this. The Jonin interrupted the silence as we got a few kilometers away from the clearing. They knew where we were going to end up. They had pictures taken in Kanoha, and they certainly weren't Karigaka Shinobi, despite the armbands. I'd seen enough Mistborn in my time to recognize them. It's strange that they didn't expect to see a second team. Or they wouldn't have hesitated, the commander nodded. It seems that the person who provided the information only knew about the Senja Dono-led team, and, taking into account all the possible opponents, picked the appropriate group. Dash as much as I hate to admit it, we would have lost against seven of them even with Nara-san's help, and we certainly couldn't have kept Ryu-chan safe. The Kinochi frowned, let alone detected them early. Thanks to the Byakugan, Ash most likely whoever sent those shinobi didn't think that I would hire one team by myself and the other by Oto-san, Mom informed after a moment's thought. Dash, if that's the case, then the attack makes sense. Is your son really an Yuzumaki? Suddenly asked Haiga, casting a fleeting glance at my hair, as if it couldn't be discerned from my eyes alone. Almost a complete copy of his father. Proudly declared Ma, hum, considering the clan relationships and their hereditary traits, it's quite obvious that they were hunting specifically for members of the Yuzumaki and Senju clans. He didn't add why someone would need representatives of these clans, but there are actually only a few options sealing the Biju in my case, or obtaining children with Keke Genkai from both of us. What fate awaited Linley was clear to everyone. Judging by the darkened face of the would-be victim. As soon as we arrive, I'll send a message to Otu-san, and the Nara clan will take care of the investigation. Ma promised grimly, leaping from branch to branch. I would be grateful if you keep us informed, requested the Jonin. Sighing, Mom adjusted her grip on me and nodded, increasing her speed. After what had happened, no one was particularly eager to talk, and the squad hastened to reach the coastal town, where we could hand ourselves over to the shinobi of Yazashiogaka and properly attend to the wounded. Death on the battlefield can leave an indelible impression on a child's fragile mind, sometimes leading to mental trauma. So I occasionally caught Sai's caring gaze when she turned around. Fortunately, a fair amount of cynicism and a simpler view of death had been passed down to me from my past life and training in the clan, albeit recently started, and the ability to think clearly allowed me to avoid such a fate. And I had seen corpses before, so the attack only reinforced my belief that in this world, one must be strong to protect oneself and everyone dear to them. And also, not to let others dictate the terms of how one should live. We reached the port town closer to evening the next day, encountering no further obstacles along the way. And contrary to my expectations, we were greeted there a group of four shinobi from Yuzashiogaka, had positioned themselves right by the gates. Narasaya-san approached the leader of the group, just as red-haired as the rest. Yes, Ma nodded, gesturing for the tense Kanoha shinobi to relax. I'm Yuzumaki Jansen, and we've been hired to escort you to Yuzashiogaka. All right, give me a couple of minutes and we can set off. After the mission scrolls for both teams were signed, Silo gave final instructions regarding the bodies of the attackers just in case to ensure they wouldn't accidentally disappear from the morgue and cooperation in the investigation between the Nara and Senju clans. Despite her brother being the head of the clan, he preferred not to contradict the wishes of his wife or sister. When it came to matters not related to politics, the vast majority of men in the clan were under the thumb of women during ordinary life and preferred not to cause trouble in that regard. After enduring the farewell squeezing from Linley and literally squeezing out a promise to visit her sometime, accompanied by Mom's sly laughter, we parted ways and, together with the shinobi from Yuzashiogaka, headed to the ship awaiting us in the port. I quickly grew tired of looking at the city, as it was almost indistinguishable from the part of Kinoha where ordinary people lived. So I turned my attention to more interesting personalities. The four shinobi, who had the same hair color as me. 
The three boys and one girl hardly differed in appearance from their colleagues in Kinoha, except that they were all Chunin and looked about 1718, but in appearance could easily pass for that age, of course, except for Senju. The quartet effortlessly demonstrated the noble blood flowing in their veins, movements filled with inner dignity, posture, and barely noticeable body movements, along with completely natural behavior, left no doubt that they belonged to an ancient clan that had existed since the time of the Sage of the Six Paths. Actually, out of the eight who accompanied us, only the Jonin could boast of such qualities. The same Inuzuka didn't particularly stand out from the other Chunin. Actually, now it's clear how I managed to come into this world. If all Yuzumaki are so beautiful, then not every woman can resist, especially with the right approach. And the red-haired Kinochi clearly didn't lack attention, considering the looks she received from all the men in the city. Well, it remains only to regret that I'm not 10 or 12 years older. The appearance, however, is not the most remarkable feature of our companions. And if I didn't notice it right away, then after 10 minutes I managed to figure out some irregularity in the sensation of the Yuzumaki. At first glance, my sensor abilities identified the chakra reserve of each Chunin as almost equal to Mom's, which is clearly not uncommon for members of this clan, so I didn't pay much attention to it. But over time I began to notice some irregularity. If for many ordinary Chunin, chakra felt like an amorphous formation within the body's contour, then for the red-haired Chunin, it was more like a thick liquid, much denser than for ordinary shinobi. And only after I closed my eyes and tried to concentrate on my sensations, my jaw dropped they were hiding their chakra, and each of the Yuzumaki had a reserve exceeding what Linley had by three or four times. Damn, now it's clear why all five great nations were afraid of them. If a Chunin has so much chakra, then how much did Jounin and Cage have? And this is not to forget that the chakra of the red-haired clan is much stronger than that of ordinary shinobi. At least now it's clear why Kumo wanted to get Kushina in a couple of generations. The village that laid hands on the last representative of the clan will gain a significant advantage over its neighbors in combat power. Taking a step back from the shock, I sighed and looked sadly at the ship we were heading towards. I'm afraid if what I discovered concerns all the shinobi of Yuzashiogaka no Sato, then my sensor abilities will undergo a thorough examination. However, I have a couple of days to at least slightly dampen my sensitivity. In two days, Anbu's underground base knee, Danzo Shimura's office, Dash Danzo Sama, the monotonous voice of a shinobi who appeared from the darkness of the office, made the head of Anbu's underground organization raise his head from his papers. Ash report. Ash, the mission to capture the representatives of the Senju and Yuzumaki clan ended in failure. The subordinate reported in a voice devoid of any emotion. Dash, the seven operatives sent on the mission did not report in on time. Ash, if they don't show up within five hours, send a couple of scouts to the suspected capture site, Shimura ordered after a few minutes of deliberation not showing a shade of displeasure at the news. Have one more man stand guard at the gate, and if Senju's team returns to the village, report to me immediately. One day later, Hokage's office. Ash Danzo Danzo, you and your emotionless dummies are getting a little crazy. The third Hokage shook his head, taking a long puff from his favorite smoking pipe, and glaring at his old rival. Ash trying to capture a member of the Senju clan and a relative of the ruling Nara family would be a total loss of mind. Ash, I don't know what you mean. Hokage sama Danzo replied nonchalantly. Dash you don't. Perhaps this will refresh your memory. Saratobi snorted, tossing a small scroll to the head of Anbu's spin-off. Ash, and what does it have to do with me when the report mentions Kiri Shinobi? Ash, the former Shinobi gave a natural look of surprise. But there was no one in the office to appreciate his efforts. Ash, and that's because you shouldn't think others are dumber than you are, especially members of the Nara clan. Ash the Hokage suddenly growled, accompanying his words with a tremendous amount of sight pressure. Ash this morning, the official who leaked the information that Rai Yuzumaki Nara and his mother and Senju Linli's team were leaving the village, as well as where they were going, died unexpectedly in the Anbu dungeon. Do you think our chief strategist will be able to put two and two together to get the right conclusion? Especially with five bodies that hardly belong to the Karigaka Shinobi, and who used techniques typical of the Fire Nation when they were alive. The head of the root prudently remained silent, hesitant to object. 
Dash Danzo, despite the lack of direct evidence against you and your organization, thanks solely to my intervention, Nara was able to put two and two together to reach a conclusion. Unfortunately for you, he shared it with his allies, Senju, Inyazuka and Hayuga. Ash, what does that have to do with the latter? Hokage Sama. Dash you see, my old friend, you made the mistake of thinking that since Nara Saya only hired one escort team, they would be the only ones guarding her. Saratobi took a drag on his pipe. Unfortunately for you, Patriarch Nara hired another team led by Yonchi Hayuga of the main branch of the clan. Danzo's stone-faced mask cracked slightly due to the nervous twitching of his right eye. The third Hokage paused meaningfully and blew a ring of smoke, letting such news settle in the mind of his interlocutor. If the perpetrator of such a puncture was still alive, the aging shinobi would do his best to make his death as slow and painful as possible. For the sake of the others, Dash as recently as today, a couple hours ago, I had a very unpleasant meeting with the heads of the six clans and Mito Yuzumaki, who was kindly privy to Senju's situation. And I really didn't like to listen to that barrage of quite fair slop that was poured on my head due to the loss of a valuable source of information under the protection of my Anbu. And especially the fact that if it happened again and all the evidence was lost by accident, the clans would take over the investigation, and no one, including me, would be spared. Ash, I understand, Hokage-sama, Danzo bowed his head, hiding the disgruntled grin that crept onto his face, despite the efforts of the experienced shinobi. Dash, it's good that you understand, Saratobi nodded. I don't mind when you recruit among the orphans from the orphanage. But if you decide to do the same with clan children, you can order your own coffin. I'll personally rip your head off, just so I won't be removed as Hokage, just because I'm as responsible for the actions of your people as you are. Don't get too excited Danzo, or we'll both go down. Do you understand me dash yes? Hokage Sama. I understand, Shimura replied flatly, bowing in a bow, and trying to hide the rage that was seething inside. For a veteran of the Great Shinobi War, it was becoming more and more difficult to defy the will of the clan leaders every year, and only their impending weakening or even destruction warmed Shimura's soul. Dash Hirazan relaxed and said to his former rival, Don't forget that the clans currently make up two-thirds of our fighting strength, and on the eve of a new war is not the time for internal strife. Ash yes, Hokage-sama, I understand that, Danzo nodded and walked out of the office. Dash you do understand, but you're not going to give up your dream of having a Keke Genkai soldier in your army. Saratobi sighed, returning to the curse of any leader. Paperwork. Four days of sailing passed boringly and monotonously, due to the almost complete absence of favorable winds. I scoured the small ship, which was supposed to take us to Yuzushiogaka, inside and out, but found nothing interesting, except for a couple of rats in the hold. In the end, not wanting to waste time, I returned to practicing chakra control. It was difficult to do anything else on the swelling ship. Unfortunately, I couldn't chat with fellow clan members for the simple reason that even at sea, they continued to guard us diligently and showed no interest in engaging in casual conversation. Well, at least the Yuzumaki didn't pay attention to the fact that I was a half-blood. If a famous users of Dejutsu were in their place, I would have been subjected to a barrage of disdainful glances. And only closer to evening, when a strip of land belonging to the huge island appeared in the distance, something interesting began to happen. Mama specifically pulled me out of our cabin to demonstrate one of Yuzashiogaka's most famous landmarks, the giant whirlpools surrounding the island, and serving as an insurmountable defense against any enemy. Wishing to attack the Yuzumaki clan, even from a distance, the site was mesmerizing huge funnels inexorably sucking in everything that came within a sufficient distance. And the closer we got, the clearer the true scale of these whirlpools compared to our ship became. Fortunately, we didn't get too close the shinobi accompanying us jumped into the water and began forming hand seals. At least, that's what I assumed, since I couldn't see anything from behind. However, after all four of them simultaneously placed their hands on the water and released a huge amount of chakra, a gigantic bridge began to rise from the depths about four meters wide and about one and a half kilometers long at least. That's how much distance remained to sail to the pier on the island. And it wouldn't have been so surprising if it were a normal stone bridge. 
What amazed me the most was the fact that its entire visible surface was covered with seals, many, many seals glowing with chakra. With my senses, I perceived the bridge as one giant chakra accumulator. And this despite the fact that until recently, it wasn't even felt underwater. That's what it means true masters of seals. But they didn't let me stare for long mama picked me up in her arms, and together with her escorts, we waited until the ship docked at the end of the bridge then jumped onto the wet stone and ran to the island, where we were already awaited. Among the few groups of teenagers aged 10 to 12, obviously performing d rank tasks at the port instead of workers, stood out the tall figure of a red-haired person in the traditional kimono colors of the Yuzumaki clan. And the closer the distance got, the more my jaw dropped, and my eyes widened to San. The smiling red-haired man standing before us was a perfect copy of Ryuta, from his dark grey-green eyes to his completely identical physique. But how could this be? We received a letter about his death, didn't we? I almost guessed. The Yuzumaki who greeted us shook his head and waved away the papers of our escorts, shifting all his attention to us. I'm Ryuji Yuzumaki, and I'm your grandfather. He sadly smiled and took me from my mother's hands. So young, you wouldn't give him more than 20 and change. I skeptically chuckled, discerning from a closer distance the wrinkles barely beginning to show on his face. Maybe you're my uncle. Our clan's famous longevity in action. He laughed, finishing his inspection and seating me on his lap. I'm actually 53 years old. Getting comfortable. I wrapped my newfound grandfather around the neck and turned to my mother, giving us a chance to get acquainted without any formalities. Hello, Raiji san Sana bowed. Despite the sad occasion, I'm always glad for our new meeting. Girl, no need to bow to me. We're family after all. Yuzumaki shook his head and stepped forward, embracing mom with his free arm, pressing her to his chest. Considering he was almost a head taller than her and twice as wide, this maneuver of his succeeded effortlessly even without my presence. Hum and dad was a hand shorter, maybe he hadn't grown to his natural height yet. Such a thought made me sad now I won't even get to see him one more time. Well, alright, we'll have time to catch up, Raiji stepped back. But for now, let's return to Yuzashi Ogaka. Naturally, no one objected. So we left the port town. Along the way, I noticed that on both sides beyond the sparse forest, quite tall and steep mountains rose, securely locking away the other parts of the island from anyone wishing to turn aside from the only path laid out from the port. Natural defense not bad. Even Shinobi would have to work hard to get through there. After an hour of swift running, we found ourselves inside of the Shinobi village. Welcome to Yuzashiogaka no Sato, Ryu-chan. Grandpa ruffled my hair, noticing my somewhat bewildered look. And there was plenty to be amazed about from the low helic where we stopped. There was a beautiful view of the valley, in the middle of which lay the village of the Yuzumaki clan. And what I had seen of Kanoha, considered the largest and strongest among the five countries did not prepare me for the sight that unfolded before me. Where to begin? The first thing that really caught the eye were the walls. The walls of Yuzashiogaka, at least the outer part, were made not of wood, clay, or stone, but of black metal. And it wouldn't be just any metal, practically every inch of free space was covered with an array of huge seals. Moreover, each of them literally breathed power and emitted light, visible even to the naked eye. What volume of artifact must it be to maintain the entire defense complex with such power? The one in the basement of our house is a 5 centimeter metal cube covered in seals, costing about 10 million Ryu and capable of maintaining a barrier and other surprises for uninvited guests for four years when fully charged. Here, the artifact will obviously be bigger and more expensive. And this is with the height of the walls almost equal to those protecting Kanoha. The second thing that surprised me was the size of Yazashiogaka. Considering that only one Yuzumaki clan and some amount of ordinary population live here, any person would expect a settlement a hundred times smaller than the other great villages. The Hyuga, who are home to one of the largest clans, now number no more than 3,000 people, and that's including ordinary members not trained as shinobi. Here, the village is the size of one-tenth of the leaf. With a population of about 200,000 people, there will be at least 20 an unimaginable number for just one clan. And the third thing that certainly caught my attention were the palace roofs towering above the walls. Anyone who has seen a Japanese imperial palace will understand me. Unfortunately, because of the walls, only the top two floors and the terrace with a small garden were visible. 
but if you estimate by eye, that's at least six or seven stories. Considering even the Hokage Tower, which doesn't exceed four, it's worth praising the masters who managed to do without modern construction machinery and materials relying solely on stone, wood, and metal. Well, and with the help of Shinobi, who can often replace any construction equipment. Well, how do you like the site? Grandpa proudly smirked, giving me some time to gather myself. Our clan has been living in this place for over a thousand years, and is capable of repelling any attack from those daring to assail us. The village's location was deliberately chosen to block access to the depths of the island. Yeah, but the combined strength of two great villages, along with possible treachery, might be enough, I thought to myself. After admiring the majestic spectacle for a little longer, we descended and headed towards the large gates, currently open, guarded by a team of four Chunin and a pair of Jonin. While with the former, I could still feel the true volumes of Chakra. No matter how hard they tried to conceal it, with the senior ranking comrades, this wasn't the case their chakra volume was on par with Senju's and all. It made me wonder how much chakra my grandpa had even considering my proximity to him. I could only sense a small reserve, at the level of an experienced Chunin. But I doubted if it was really the case the guards let us pass without questions, simply glancing at grandpa, and each of them bowed, showing respect. And as I learned from my father, Yuzumaki receives such respect only from those who have earned it through their deeds and personal strength. So, this only means one thing this representative of the Yuzumaki clan has perfect chakra control. For a clan of chakra monsters, regular shinobi can reduce their chakra levels to almost that of an ordinary person, and the ability to conceal it. You don't have to try, Raiji chuckled, noticing my half-closed eyes in concentration. For a true Yuzumaki, chakra control is a matter of life and death. Damn it, Dad said that men in his family have sensory abilities. That means they should be able to sense others. Why? I wondered. With a volume, control for techniques isn't that important. Of course, that's true, Grandpa agreed, leisurely walking down the street and nodding at the smiles and greetings of most passers-by. But even the green genin of our clan usually have several times more chakra than the average chunin from the great villages. You can imagine the situation with those who have a higher rank. Any, even the lousiest sensor, can notice us from afar without much effort if we don't hide. Even simple shinobi who train in chakra sensing, can detect us from a distance of several hundred meters. That's why having perfect control, as much as possible, is vital for all yuzumaki, regardless of the available chakra volume. You can always camouflage yourself from most shinobi who haven't developed this aspect of their abilities. Hum looking at the situation from this angle, control is indeed vital, otherwise ambushes reconnaissance, and espionage would only be a dream. Nodding in agreement to Grandpa, I started looking around. Unlike Kanoha, where most buildings were constructed in the style of European structures, simple boxes no higher than two or three stories, and only clan estates had Japanese style. Here it was the opposite a classic settlement of ancient Japan with single-story buildings. And overall, everything here literally breathed antiquity, despite the fact that the houses looked almost new. I suppose it's the work of seals. What surprised me was the liveliness of the streets they were far from Kanoha, but for a village on a relatively large island, it was impressive. And also the amount of greenery around wide paths ran next to the houses, bushes, trees, and flowers were planted in front of them, forming a kind of park area. And in the middle, the main road was paved with stone tiles. It looked very similar to avenues back home, and was incredibly beautiful. I envy those who live here the houses on our streets are practically devoid of greenery. And our passers-by aren't as friendly and smiley as I noticed during walks with mom. Moreover, the vast majority of the locals here are re-deeds. No other colors are present I notice blondes, brunettes, chestnuts, re-deeds. And even a few really exotic shades. But they were a drop in the ocean. And literally each of them had a much larger chakra volume than regular residents. It's very simple. For every Yuzumaki... The amount of available chakra directly affects the speed of wound healing and overall lifespan, Grandpa answered my question. That's why even those who decide not to become shinobi undergo initial training to increase their chakra volume and control over it. 
As a result, even ordinary residents in our village live up to a hundred years and are capable of using several techniques. Damn, now it's clear why the village got its unofficial name the Longevity Village. And how old is the oldest Yuzumaki? I asked. The highest age recorded in our chronicles is 500 years, Ryuji replied. Our cage at the moment is almost 300 years old, and intends to live for another as much. No wonder our village is called the Village of Long Livers. Holy crap my eyes almost popped out of my head from those numbers. Does that mean if I have a reserve comparable to an ordinary cage, I'll live two to three hundred years for sure? Wow, screw chakra exhaustion. I'll train relentlessly. Wait, the first Jinchuriki died of old age before or during the second Shinobi World War. So, judging by the age of the Senju brothers, she should have been around 150 years old when she died. Hardly the age for a truly strong Yuzumaki. Considering her ability to instantly seal a biju within herself, she cannot be considered weak by definition. But why guess, it's better to ask. What about Mito Yuzumaki? I asked. Hum, what do you mean? Grandpa raised an eyebrow. Why is she considered old if strong Yuzumaki live very long? Well, there are several factors that can affect the lifespan of a shinobi with our Keke Jankai. Ryoji slowly replied, throwing a quick questioning glance at mom. She responded with an almost imperceptible nod. Are they so excited because of the status of the first Hokage's wife? You see, Mito herself is the Jinchuriki of the Nine Tails. If you know the meaning of that word, Grandpa continued with a sigh. The power of human sacrifice. I replied, earning a shocked look from both adults. So I had to explain. I read a book about Biju and the Sage of Six Parts in the library. Now the kids are going. Grandpa muttered to himself, earning a laugh from Sai. He's Nara, Mom smiled. And he's already smarter than most adults outside our clan. And his cousin has been beating almost any opponent in Shogi. Since he was five. Yeah, and I'm six years old and embarrassingly lose in two out of five games. Despite having years of life experience. It's frustrating. What my son got involved in, Yuzumaki jokingly shook his head. At his age, I was more worried about games and training. And I couldn't be dragged to books, even if you pulled me by the ears. Let alone visiting the clan library. To such a confession, I just snorted without books. Nara can only get bored to death, as most kids prefer to relax in their free time, rather than play games. Of course, this applies exclusively to physical games, not intellectual ones like Shogi and Go. The latter is less popular, but also present. Okay, let's get back to the topic of discussion because of her status. Mito not only gets the opportunity to contain and use the power of the Biju, but also acquires a number of drawbacks, Grandpa inhaled. The chakra of the Nine Tails is very poisonous, and even despite our Keke Genkai, capable of suppressing it thanks to unique chakra, it still damages the body simply by its presence, and when used, significantly reduces the expected lifespan. Considering the fact that the fox sealed inside her was already an adult, it also affected the aging rate. So it turns out that instead of the two to three hundred years allotted to one of the strongest Kinoichi of our clan, Mito will live much less. And what about other Jinchuriki? There are known cases when they live to old age, being ordinary people without any Keke Jenkai. I was surprised. Firstly, this applies to less powerful Biju, whose chakra is not so poisonous. And secondly, it all depends on the type and timing of the seal application, Grandpa explained. The younger the vessel, the more likely it is that the body and chakra system will adapt to the additional source without harmful consequences for the carrier. Got it. I nodded and suddenly yawned unexpectedly for myself. Tired of new impressions. Sai smiled. It's okay, we'll be there soon, Raiji reassured me. While I was absorbing the new information, we gradually approached the center of the village, where the palace was located, and the usual houses around were replaced by long fences, usually indicating that the land around belonged to the part of the village where high-ranking shinobi or entire clans reside. After all, Besides the house itself, Chunin and Jonin also need a closed area for personal training, where outsiders are better off not being admitted, especially if there are a Chiha nearby. At least, that's the situation in Kanoha. I don't think it's different here, it was created with the involvement of the Yuzumaki. 
And there's a house already visible, Ryuji nodded ahead pointing to a pagoda rising above the red stone fence. Approaching the gates, he simply ran his hand over them, and the briefly appeared seal extinguished, and they swung open. Entering, we found ourselves in the middle of a small park leading to the house. Bonsai trees were growing to full height on either side, trim bushes very similar to rose hips and barberries, small beds of some small blue-yellow flowers, and a bunch of other miscellaneous things. I didn't look closer as we stepped onto a small platform, covered with gravel from which steps led to the entrance of the house. There was no sign of anyone alive inside. Interesting, such a huge house and for just one grandpa climbed the stairs, pushed the door aside, and upon entering, set me down on the floor. Well, here we are, he smiled, take off your shoes and come inside, taking off my sandals which had rubbed my feet quite a bit over the week of travels. I set them aside and, not waiting for the adults, pushed open the next door and stepped inside. It was dark and crowded with, Welcome to the family, Rai. Suddenly the lights flashed on and the cry almost startled me. Blinking several times, I stared. Holy crap in front of me stood a real crowd of three or four dozen redeeds. Children, teenagers, adults, and elderly of both sexes stood there, smiling widely at me, practically radiating joy. And there were barriers on the house. That was my first thought. Um, hello. I stammered uncertainly and bowed. Kami. He looks just like Ryu in his childhood. One of the women exclaimed, and these simple words seemed to burst the dam. This horde of people rushed to greet me. Over the next 20 minutes, I found myself hugged and smothered by women almost to death, learned about the existence of second, third, fourth cousins, nieces and nephews, uncles and aunts, various grandmothers and grandfathers and four generations before grandpa, and even more various relatives. But most importantly, each of them was genuinely happy to see me, despite having met me just a few minutes ago. Realizing that they were so happy to see me only because I was related to everyone, I almost cried in the most natural way and my mouth stretched into the biggest smile life had ever produced. What can I say? A child's body equals emotional intensity. All right, let the lad rest and set the table, Raiji finally intervened. Don't rush, Oto-san. The girl, who introduced herself as Tomoko, waved her hand, everything's ready long ago. We were just waiting for you. Then what are we waiting for? To the table. The ensuing merriment more resembled the celebration of some grand event rather than a family gathering. But from the snippets of conversation I caught, I understood it was a regular meal in this family. Not that I didn't like it, but compared to the Nara clan and the relatively quiet life with Saya, it was a completely different experience. Thanks to Tomoko taking care of me, I ate like a boa constrictor, and, tiredly nodding off in an attempt not to fall asleep, caught a piece of an interesting conversation between mom and grandpa. The funeral ceremony has already been held. Yes, we managed to bring the body home. So the cremation ceremony was held at dawn, and the ashes were entrusted to the ocean. His favorite sword was placed in the mausoleum. So tomorrow I'll accompany you to pay your last respects to the departed. Hum? The Yuzumaki cremate their dead and entrust the ashes to water. Perhaps that's why Kabuto didn't resurrect anyone from the Seal Master's clan. With his Edo Tensei technique, no even a particle of the deceased no summon soul. But I'll do my best to ensure that the bespectacled guy is out of the game beforehand or doesn't have a chance to fall into a Ruchimaru's clutches at all. There's still plenty of time and opportunities to steer history in a different direction before the Third Shinobi World War, especially for someone who has reliable information about the future. Mentally promising myself to do everything possible to save people who died solely because of utterly idiotic reasons, like envy and greed. I lost the battle against fatigue, and, closing my eyes, drifted off to sleep. He's not used to such feasts, Sida shook her head, watching her sleeping son, who leaned against Ryuta's sister and quietly snored, paying no attention to the noise around. If you had stayed with us instead of deciding to return to Kanoha, he would have grown up in a large family. Literally in a sea of love and care, Tomoko shook her head. It's evident that such a situation is very unusual for him. It's not that simple, sighed Nara. I simply wouldn't have been allowed to leave being born into the clan head's family has its drawbacks. Then stay at least for six months, Raiji suggested. I'll train him a bit to the level of our children. It will greatly help him in the future. I don't know if Oto-san will allow it. 
He's very attached to Raya Chan. Saya shook her head. Right that I want to get to know my grandson better he'll understand, Yuzumaki insisted. After all, six months can't compare to the few years he spent together. Okay, tomorrow I'll send a letter and if it works out, we'll visit you. The Kyunochi relented. I'll take care of the little one during this time. Tomoko exclaimed quietly, stroking little Nara's head, lying on her lap. He slid there during sleep, and not without a little help from the amused relative. I don't mind, sometimes taking care of even such quiet children as in our clan is very exhausting. Great. Then I'll take him to the already prepared bed, and we'll continue the feast with something stronger. Yuzumaki joyfully picked up the sleeping boy in her arms, and hurried to the staircase to the second floor, leading to the guest rooms. The first few days as a guest among numerous relatives I spent in a daze. Simply due to the close proximity of so many strong sources of chakra, of course. Most of the people around me hid their true volumes well, but my sensor gift gradually got used to recognizing such chakra sources, and it didn't make it easier. And that's not to mention the huge number of seals literally flooding the Yuzumaki house. Compared to the level of comfort I had in my previous life, seals definitely win simply because of their multifunctionality and ease of use for shinobi, water supply and heating in the bathroom, strengthening walls and blocking sounds, air filtration from dust and odors, use in food heating, drying clothes, lighting and heating, food preservation, and much more. The list could go on indefinitely fuinjutsu was used everywhere. It was enough to have chakra to activate them. And clan members always had plenty of this stuff. And most importantly, it was simply impossible to get bored in Grandpa's huge house. There was always someone nearby willing to take on the task of entertaining or interesting me. What struck me the most was the huge number of guests who visited the house, just to see me and get acquainted. By the most modest estimates, the total number exceeded 400. Too many for me, accustomed to a fairly limited circle of communication even within the clan. Nevertheless, all this was more than compensated for by the sincere joy of the guests who came to visit. From all this, I drew one firm conviction there are no bad Yuzumaki. Literally every member of the clan I saw was distinguished by astonishing cheerfulness, tender attitude towards children, and the ability to enjoy life. When I asked Grandpa about this, he seriously replied that even a thousand years ago the clan didn't differ much in its outlook on life from the present. Yuzumaki have always been able to enjoy the smallest things, and communication is one of them. Considering the tradition of having no fewer than three or four children, there's simply no time for sadness and melancholy. Besides, others in the clan don't survive. I didn't understand the last phrase, but dismissed it as insignificant, somewhat surprised by the answer. A stark contrast to the headstrong but dreadfully lazy Naras. And despite spending only a few days in such an environment, Yuzashogaka became much closer to being associated with home than Kanoha. The people here are much friendlier, more energetic, cheerful, and generous. By the way, about generosity the numerous guests literally overwhelmed me with gifts. Various clothes, shoes, weapons necessary for a shinobi career, both in my size and for growing up. When I learned that among the redeeds such a term is very common, I had to suppress the desire to burst out laughing hello, homeland. Dash such a concept simply doesn't exist among the Naras. All things are bought only when needed. Numerous scrolls for studying and creating simple fuinjutsu and keke, training weights, both with and without seals, everyday outfits in clan colors, several sizes of simply gorgeous traditional silk kimonos. Sets of special paper and ink for drawing seals, training weapons. Even several scrolls with water techniques and tojutsu and kenjutsu styles, studied and kept by clan members. But most of all, I like the non-material gifts. With special ink containing my blood, they applied an infu into my forehead, forming a very familiar crystal after several hours of application and activation, which adorned the same place on Yuzumaki Mito and Senjutsu Nade. Considering the amount of chakra I had to pump into it just to get the seal to work, it commanded respect almost five-sixths of my entire volume. By the way, a similar thing adorned almost half of the adult shinobi in the middle of the forehead or at the bangs, covered with hair. Directly opposite the heart, a resistance seal has now appeared, designed to train the speed of all future shinobi of the clan, 
and just above the wrists on the inside, two universal storage seals were applied, capable of self-restoration even when damaged, along with the skin healing process. A stark contrast to sealing scrolls. In general, gifts overwhelm me above my head, and this is not an exaggeration. However, Vigilant Mom quickly confiscated all the scrolls and real weapons from me. But it didn't diminish my joy. By the end of the first week, after the main hustle and bustle and the influx of guests had died down a bit, I got a chance to talk to Grandpa about the impending war, and a conversation I overheard almost a year ago. Ryuji and I were sitting alone playing another game of Shogi in his room, while the rest of the household went about their business, including Mom Tomoko-chan dragged her out shopping. So, once again victorious, I made sure no one was eavesdropping, and, putting on the most serious expression, asked Grandpa to set up a barrier. Mm. Yuzumaki didn't immediately catch on to what I was asking, busy examining the board and pondering the moves that led to his defeat. We need to talk, and I wouldn't want anyone to accidentally overhear, I said. All right, Rai kun he folded a few almost imperceptible hand seals and placed his hand on the floor, emitting a small burst of chakra. In the next moment, chains of symbols ran across the floor in different directions, and the room was enveloped in a misty barrier. Now no one can hear us or see us. Not even with the Byakugan, Grandpa informed me, instantly transforming before me into a focused and ready shinobi, who had seen quite a lot in his lifetime. What did you want to talk about? Is the Yuzumaki clan aware of the impending war? Yes, we know about the clashes that have begun on the border between Ivy and Suna. Kanoha has provided us with enough information, and about the buildup of military power in Kiri and Kumo, amassing their forces and border garrisons. Judging by the slightly surprised expression, it seemed that Kanoha hadn't bothered to convey this piece of information to the Yuzumaki. No, we didn't know about that, Grandpa confirmed my observation. Where are you going with this? With a very high probability, the first target for these forces will be Yuzashio. I sighed deeply, delivering yet another shocking piece of news to the unprepared listener. And you can't count on any allied assistance, Hokage. And the elders have decided to trade you for the opportunity to test their future opponent, and the desire to preserve their shinobi for a close encounter with Ivy and Suna. If the war gets too close to the Fire Country's borders, or disturbs more valuable allies. But why we've helped so many Grandpa clearly wasn't prepared for this. After the First Great War, Shinobi and the loss of a huge number of strong fighters, including the first two Hokage, the Senja lost much of their influence in the village, and are unlikely to influence anything except rushing to help you themselves and perish together. I interrupted Grandpa, who was clearly taken aback. After that, there was a few minutes of silence, during which Raiji collected himself and began to ponder something. How did you find out? Just because I'm still little doesn't mean I don't understand anything. I smirked and recounted the conversation I accidentally overheard word for word. In simpler terms, our demise will allow Leaf to significantly reduce their losses, gain the opportunity to get their hands on a bit of our knowledge and wealth, and also significantly thin out the forces of the two great villages, Grandpa muttered. But disclosing such information can be considered treason to our clan, and if Kanoha finds out about it, you'll be in trouble. Why did you still decide to tell me? Apart from the desire to prevent the destruction of the village of Kishina, the disappearance of such a colorful and ancient clan, the loss of centuries-old knowledge of Fuinjutsu and Keke Genkai, and simply the death of a huge number of beautiful women with luxurious crimson hair, whom I have a certain weakness for. Probably the desire to find out how simply disclosing information will affect future events on a global scale. But I won't tell anyone about it, ever. Firstly, I'm not betraying, just fulfilling the terms of an allied agreement even if a Hokage decided to unilaterally terminate this agreement without notice. I clarified. And secondly, I like it here way more than in Kanoha. And I really don't like the fact that so many wonderful people can die solely because of the decision of a few old farts seeking benefit only for themselves. As soon as I finished my outraged tirade, Grandpa chuckled. As long as there are people in Kanoha like you, there is still hope, and I'm very proud to have such a grandson. Ryuji proudly declared. Yeah. I'm glad for myself too. I replied, puffing up my chest with a self-satisfied expression. 
but I couldn't hold it for long, and joined in the laughter with Yuzumaki. And what will you do now, in light of the revealed danger? Grandpa asked a little later, when we had calmed down. I don't know yet, he shook his head, first I'll deliver the news to the Yuzukage, and then the entire clan council will decide. Of course, I don't understand much about military matters. But why don't you just hide the whole island from everyone? After all, you're no masters of barriers. So set up some kind of spatial temporal barrier. If they really decide to attack you, I suggested. Are you sure you're only four years old, Raikun? Yuzumaki asked, shaking his head. At your age, your head should be filled with games and mischief, not world-scale problems. Huh, I'm a Nara, and as you had the chance to see in our recent game, smarter than you, I couldn't resist teasing my relative. Hey, it was just one game. The SEAL's master exclaimed indignantly. The second one will have the same result. We'll see about that. But returning to the topic at hand even if we were to erect such a barrier, I doubt that even our entire clan could sustain its existence for long well. Then find another source of sustenance. I shrugged. I remember reading briefly about the Chakra of the World in a book about the Sage of Six Paths. Why don't you use it? If it's really generated by the world, it certainly won't run out in the next few centuries. So all you'll have to worry about is spies and traders. It seems Saya wasn't joking when she called you a little genius, Ryuji sighed. It's easy to be a genius when you have vast amounts of information, including about the future. It's time to build a monument to myself. Alright, considering everything you've told me, we can't delay. Yuzumaki removed the barrier, stood up, and in the same moment, his exact copy appeared next to him, quickly leaving the room. Shadow clones without hand seals. Wow, my clone will inform the Yuzukage of everything, and in the meantime, we'll visit a clan's training grounds. Grandpa answered my questioning look. With the impending war, you'll need all the help you can get, and I'm not planning to bury you anytime soon, Ryakun. That means training, and more training, and I don't mind considering the general laziness of all Nara. I'll have to push for extra training, and considering the general endurance of all red-haired shinobi, including myself, I don't think many will be able to keep up with me. The training grounds for young shinobi in Kinochi of Yuzashio were located outside the walls, just like the shinobi academy itself, so it took us about half an hour to get there, considering the speed of movement at the level of an average chunin, set by grandpa. Interestingly, there were only a couple of genin guarding the opposite gates through which we left the village, indicating the level of possibility of attack from this side of the island. Considering the whirlpools surrounding the entire island and the absence of a port to overcome them, one might as well forget about guarding. Because even with a divine predisposition to the water element, attempting to stop kilometers wide water funnels could be considered suicide. And for the Jinchuriki as well, do any other settlements exist on the island? I asked the elder, just to pass the time as we made our way to the training grounds. A few small seasonal settlements for farmers and a couple of minor towns, replied Grandpa. We grow all our food thanks to the fertile soil. We only have to import spices and some herbs that prefer a different climate. Do you sell food? We could, but it would require expanding our fields, which would negatively impact the island's environment. Then what do you sell if the Yuzumaki clan is considered one of the richest in the world? I was surprised. Our island is very rich in various metals, including precious ones. We are one of the main suppliers of chakra conducting metal to the fire country, as well as excellent weapons. Weapons. Our blacksmiths are almost as renowned for their craftsmanship as those from the iron country. But considering that each blade is considered a true work of art due to the seals on them, not many can afford to buy them, Ryugi enlightened me. Some of the weapons of the famous Karigaka's seven swordsmen are made here. And let's not forget about a main source of income for Yuenjutsu. Kanoha pays Yuzashio considerable sums for the opportunity to use a defensive seals on their walls, and it's not the only one. Wow, my relatives have quite the setup. No wonder they're considered very wealthy with such earning opportunities. It's hard to stay poor. As we chatted, Grandpa led me to the academy buildings and a huge field behind them, divided into uniform squares. Most of them were free but some were occupied by small groups of future shinobi. And not just those aged 6 or 7 when they entered the local assassin school, but even younger. It was to the latter that we headed, and here awaited me a shock. 
And I bet it would shock anyone in my place right before my eyes. A little squirt under the guidance of a teacher, dressed in a cute green jumpsuit, about my Asian half a head shorter, effortlessly unleashed five cage bunchins, and started training chakra. And this despite the fact that women generally have a naturally lower chakra volume than men. How on earth? Watching my dropped jaw, Grandpa just smirked and began to explain the obvious truths to them. At a young age, the body's chakra coils are not yet fully formed and are easily subject to change and growth. Plus, each Yuzumaki has several more coils than ordinary people, which is why all our children start learning control at the age of three or four and at the same time, their chakra volume rapidly increases. It's a constant race of size and control in their young years. Even I devote one day a week entirely to this matter. At the moment, this little girl has twice the reserves you do, which allows her to create such a number of cage bunchins and jutsus. Essentially, for any Yuzumaki, this technique is akin to the standard shadow clone technique taught at your Shinobi Academy. Unbelievable. And I thought I was increasing my chakra volume at a rapid pace. Compared to all the other kids, what a disgrace. A crushing blow to my pride. This way I'll earn an inferiority complex. And this is not even considering that this little tyke, just like all the other redhead shinobi of both genders and different ages surrounding me, concealed their true chakra volumes. Much better than I could even dream of at the moment. Damn, over a year of training wasted, and already such a difference. And that's precisely why I decided to train you during the six months you'll be staying with us. Ryugi's voice pulled me out of self-flagellation. Really? I stared at the elder Yuzumaki with hopeful eyes. Absolutely true. He nodded. But before we begin, tell me. What ninja arts have you chosen as your main focus? Medical ninjutsu primarily. Since with such skills and regeneration from our KK Genkai, I'll be practically invincible as long as I have chakra. Plus, high-level medical ninjas are extremely rare, and no one will send them into battle recklessly. I answered after some thought. Then comes Fuinjutsu, Ninjutsu, and Jinjutsu, followed by Tajutsu and Kinjutsu. But overall, I don't intend to limit myself to narrow specialization. Hum, interesting choice. You'll have to study medicine in Kanoha, as we mainly focus on combat medical ninjutsu here. But there are very few of them. Yuzumaki almost never suffer from common illnesses, and can survive even fatal injuries for others. I recall the Nara clan is famous for their medicines and medical practices, so you'll delve into that at home. I'll brush you up on the basics of Fuinjutsu, and as for ninjutsu, only when you're a bit older, otherwise you might end up rupturing your chakra pathways during elemental technique conversion. Your control for Jinjutsu is too poor at the moment, so even the most primitive techniques won't work. Not to mention that among the Yuzumaki, this field isn't popular for quite obvious reasons. As for Tajutsu and Kenjutsu you're wrong to put them last. A sufficiently fast opponent could be next to you before you could finish any technique. But again, it's pointless to train them now, as you're still too young. And almost all our styles are designed for teenagers and adults. Listening to Ryugi break it all down for me, all I could do was obediently nod, confirming my understanding of everything said. That's what experience means no doubt he's taught more than one student, considering the number of offspring and their children. Given all that, what are we going to do? I asked. Our top priority right now is achieving perfect control for using medical ninjutsu and jinjutsu, as well as increasing your available chakra volume, and developing the ability to at least partially conceal your chakra, Grandpa answered. That's the main focus. Once you can create at least four clones without strain, we'll focus on your physical conditioning, while they refine your control. Weight training. No, your body is still growing, so it's best not to do that or you'll end up short for life, Yuzumaki shook his head and patted his impressive biceps. The bodies of the vast majority of our clan members are built for strength, and as you age, striking power will naturally come with minimal additional effort on your part. So, we'll focus on stretching, agility, and speed. With your new seal, it'll be very effective. Is everyone here using such seals? I asked. Without exception. Actually, at the moment, I have the exact same seal active it really helps keep you in shape without constant training, Yuzumaki grinned. And as for Fuinjutsu, either I or someone else in the family will work on it on a free day, 
and if there's energy left in the evenings of regular days. Quite a schedule, I muttered to myself. Yes, training you will have to be much tougher than our other children, primarily because you're lagging so far behind almost all your peers in almost every aspect, Grandpa said seriously. Plus, we only have six months to spare, and I intend to cram as much as possible into that time. Torn muscles and chakra depletion will be commonplace, so if you're not sure you can handle it better decline now. What? Backing out of a challenge, even if it means going all out I'd rather die than give up. Shaking my head vigorously, I stared expectantly at Grandpa. Watch that you don't regret it later, because there won't be any indulgence for you. Ryugi smoked sadistically, and I realized that the next six months were going to be hell. A couple of months later, Hokage's office. So, Shimura-san, what's the reason for this urgent gathering of the four of us? Saratobi Hirazan puffed his pipe meaningfully looking at his longtime friend turned rival and two elder advisors Kahari Yutatane and Hamura Mitakado, settled comfortably in chairs opposite him. I have too many concerns with the impending war to be distracted by trivial matters. We'd also like to hear about it, nodded the advisors. Before I begin, answer me one simple question. Have you heard recently about a shortage of seals, any kind explosive paralyzing, chakra suppressing, or any others. The head of the Nara clan responded with a question of his own. Hum, now that I think about it, I did receive requests to increase seal supplies from the owners of ninja equipment shops. The Hokage answered, but I considered it a temporary phenomenon, as before the last war people stock up in anticipation of hard times. I would have thought the same, if not for the fact that my shinobi are currently receiving the last reserves of seals from the warehouses and there's simply nowhere to replenish them, Danzo replied irritably. What do you mean, nowhere? Kaharu exclaimed. We have no fewer than three real seal masters, not to mention their apprentices and those few shinobi who can make basic seals at an acceptable level. In that case, I can confidently say that we no longer have any experienced fuinjutsu and kekijutsu masters, or even promising students. The aging veteran said in a solemn voice. Explain yourself, Danzo, Saratobi said, squinting. All the Yuzumaki who provided us with seals, just a week and a half ago, collectively packed their numerous belongings, sold their real estate, and hiring a dozen shinobi teams to accompany themselves, their families, and their students, headed in the direction of Yuzashi Ogoka. So now we no longer have a single truly experienced Fuinjutsu and Kekijutsu master or even a promising apprentice. How? Why wasn't I informed about this? A whole crowd of people with their belongings couldn't leave Kanoha unnoticed, Saratobi exclaimed. You forget that true Fuinjutsu masters don't need carts for their belongings. A small scroll capable of holding the contents of a couple of wagons is enough. Danzo waved his hand. And as for stealthiness, everyone who left the village are ordinary civilians, not shinobi. Within a couple of days, they hired escort teams for one day, and, showing their papers, calmly passed through the gates. I only found out about it when I checked the mission records and the list of those who passed through the gates that day. Considering that the total population of Kanoha is over 200,000, among which there are plenty of traders, a couple of dozen people can easily go unnoticed. This means they've already reached Jizashiogaka, Mitakado groaned, massaging his nose bridge in anticipation of an impending headache. Excellent, just excellent. The Hokage echoed him, foreseeing new mountains of paperwork that would soon land on his desk from the shinobi, who had lost their usual equipment. This is just the tip of the iceberg of the heap of troubles that has befallen us. Shimura sighed tiredly, temporarily shedding the almost ingrained stone mask of composure all three present in the office knew him as a seasoned politician. But the opposite was also true. Knowing you, we won't hear any good news, the elder muttered. What else happened? In order to find out the reason for such an unexpected and hasty disappearance of the Yuzumaki, I had to send my boys to all known red-haired masters, and pull a couple of strings. The head of the root grimaced. I did manage to dig up the reason they were recalled by a direct order of the Yuzukage. Could they have sniffed out about Kumo and Kiri? Saratobi frowned. If so, we may have problems. A perfectly adequate reaction to the fact that we withheld vital information, Hamura remarked. And now our hopes that the Yuzumaki clan would serve as a buffer against the two great villages may turn to dust. Unfortunately, that's not all, sighed Danzo, while investigating all the recent events. 
I stumbled upon another unpleasant piece of news. The council meeting is not coming up soon, so I'll inform you in advance the Yuzumaki not only left Kanoha, but also withdrew all their funds, except for Mito Yuzumaki's savings. So, ahead of us is an unbalanced village budget for the next year. Our merchants will surely chew our ears off about this. The further we go, the worse it gets, groaned the Hokage, receiving sympathetic looks from those present. And judging by the recent reports from my spies, the Yuzumaki are withdrawing their money from other banks in all countries as well. It's strange that we haven't heard anything about this. There are surely missing Nin who would want to profit from the gold of their clan, Kahari remarked. Against 20 Yuzumaki Jonin, that's the number of shinobi and the two teams sent to collect money. And trust me, you'd have to be a suicidal to attack them. Or shall I remind you of the strength of the average Jonin from our allies? Danzo shuddered. No one needs reminding the scenes of carnage where even a quartet of red-haired Jonin fought, made even the most seasoned veterans who had fought in the World Shinobi War, wake up in nightmares. While there were barely more than a hundred Shinobi and Kunochi of this level at Waterfall, the majority of them were at the level of lower A class, and some even higher. And one shouldn't forget about the true monsters, like the current Yuzukage, who has crossed the second hundred years, and is only growing in power they could be counted on the fingers of one hand, but Kinoha, throughout its history, had only two leaders like that, the Senja leaders, Ichiha Madara, Yuzumaki Mito, and Saratobi Hiruzen. Only the last two are alive at the moment, but it's unclear which village the Jinchuriki of the Nine-Tailed Fox belongs to now. Senja Toka could also be counted, despite her considerable age of 70, she retained all her strength, and Hatik Sukumo, who was approaching full A rank status. But that's it. The students of the third Hokage are still too young and inexperienced, and hardly will grow to the level of their teacher in their prime. The great villagers always took quantity, while Yuzashi Ogaka took exclusively quality and power of individual shinobi. I've also heard rumors that Waterfall is planning to stop Chakra conducting metal shipments soon, and their blacksmiths are hurriedly completing existing orders for weapons, and refusing to take new ones, Shimura interrupted the prolonged silence. Judging by all the signs, they're preparing for war, and probably don't consider us as allies. Damn their biju. Why now? The aging cage slammed his fist on the table. Just a couple more years. And we could have forgotten about everything except the impending war with Suna and Isla. And now we'll have to fear a stab in the back. And the Yuzumaki never had a strong intelligence network. They traditionally relied on us. But they still found out. Damn them to hell. Now is not the time for regrets, Himura frowned. First and foremost, we need to decide how to replenish the shortage of seals for our shinobi. Unfortunately, Jiraiya Kun has only just begun to grasp the basics of Fuinjutsu, and is at the beginner level, despite some talent in this area. It's moments like these that I regret Tsunade going into medicine. Saratobi replied, refilling his extinguish pipe, and lighting it up again using basic fire techniques. The same can be said for our other shinobi who decided to pursue the path of the redeeds. What about Mito-sama? The Kinochi asked. She has knowledge and experience, as well as an extensive library. Let her train capable youngsters and further educate the rest. In a couple of years, we'll have at least some trained specialists. In the worst case, we can ask her to work on creating seals. I've already tried both asking her to teach and to get some scrolls from the library, Danzo grimaced. If the heads of my four subordinates can be taken as an answer, then you understand the result of all further attempts. But if the Hokage asks, Mito-sama won't be able to refuse without a good reason, the elder suggested uncertainly. You forget who she is the Jinchuriki of the most powerful Biju. The wife of the first Hokage, a princess from the ruling family of the ancient Yuzumaki clan, a senior member of the Senju clan, and the strongest Kinochi of our village, despite her venerable age. If anyone can refuse me, it's her. Even pressure won't work, sighed Saratobi. And she has a reason she's damn old and almost in the grave, another five or six years, and we'll need a new vessel. The only consolation is that then I'll finally be able to get to her library muttered the head of the Anbu. Do you think the Senju will let you lay a finger on it? Dream on. Mitakado skeptically raised an eyebrow. If I justify it as being for the good of the village, they'll hand it over themselves no need to ask. Besides, among them, there isn't a single good Fuinjutsu master. And for those who don't understand seals, 
Such knowledge will be almost useless baggage, Shimura snapped. Perhaps, but we still need to survive until then, and the problem needs to be addressed now. Sighed and lit his pipe again the hokage. I suggest gathering all shinobi who are somewhat familiar with Fuenjutsu from non-clan backgrounds. And, based on the knowledge we have, bring them up to the level where they can produce basic seals of at least average quality, Kaharu proposed. And in the meantime, look for specialists on the side. Maybe we'll be lucky enough to poach at least one Yuzumaki with generous promises. I doubt it, they're too loyal to their clan. And Yuzukich, Saratobi shook his head, but the overall plan of action is suitable. Danzo personally take care of this and make sure everything is peaceful and without your usual methods. You can take money from the reserve fund without limitations, but you'll have to report on every rim afterward. Understood. Report to me in three weeks. That's all. I won't keep you any longer. Home, sweet home. Surveying can know her from the rooftop. I grimace thanks, but even as a guest, I was fine. Despite the almost inhuman training conditions, constant fatigue, muscles almost daily strained to their limits and a critically low level of chakra that just couldn't keep up with recovery. I felt at home in Yuzashiogaka, and having a bunch of caring relatives only added more pluses to my desire to settle down with the Yuzumaki. And let's not forget about the multitude of teachers practically lining up to teach me something useful. That's why I and mom stayed a little longer than promised almost one and a half additional months were spent on developing my sense of gift, and learning to control it, as well as mastering clan hidden jutsu, unrelated to Fuenjutsu the Kagura Shingen. It turned out, this hidden jutsu was passed down in the clan from sensor to sensor for centuries, allowing to pinpoint specific chakra targets of a person, surpassing the usual sensing range of the user. It's just unclear why Karen didn't consider herself an Yuzumaki, despite not only having the famous red mane in Keke Genkai, but also the clan hidden jutsu from Yuzashiogaka. However, I doubt that this Kyunochi will end up on Orochimaru's side, considering that her mother was supposed to end up in Kusagaka after the destruction of the Seal Master's homeland. This segment of history will go a different way. Seven and a half months in the waterfall passed almost like a single moment, and leaving was physically hard, especially realizing that perhaps I won't see anyone from my new family for a very long time. Fortunately, this time Yuzashiogaka no Sato won't be subjected to destruction. Thanks to me, its residents are prepared in advance and have a few years in reserve. I hope they won't wait for the invasion and just hide the island. Although, knowing the Yuzumaki's love for good fights, I doubt they'll miss the chance to give a thrashing to two great villages in the end. And with proper preparation, it might just work out. Sighing, I jumped off the rooftop onto the street and ran towards the market. Mom sent me for groceries for dinner. After the monstrous training of Grandpa and reaching the speed of a weak Chunin, Saya decided that I was independent enough to leave the clan lands and wander around Kanoga without escort. Considering the presence of Achiha patrols on almost every corner, I don't think anyone would dare to hassle a child from the clan. Naturally, this only applies to the trading districts in the heart of the village. I'm strictly forbidden to wander into training grounds, as well as the poorer quarters, where mainly less fortunate residents live. Where the red light district is located, several gambling and drinking establishments of low quality, cheap hotels, always present in any city, be it a capital or a shinobi village. But in Yuzashiogaka, there's nothing like that. I've roamed literally every corner of the village with the local kids, and still haven't seen anything similar. What's more, the Yuzumaki prefer to consume alcohol of their own production, and there are only three bars for a bunch of people. And there are no gambling houses at all as Grandpa told. The last newcomer who dared to organize something like that was lynched a hundred years ago. And since then, the control over all newcomers has tightened even more, and without a very compelling reason, strangers can't get onto the island even if they're allies. Yeah, despite the obvious reluctance to part with the numerous acquired family. Farewell gifts even from the Yuzukage himself warm the soul. Squinting contentedly, I remembered the moment of the presentation. Rai, take a break for a second. Grandpa's voice interrupted me from drawing another seal. What do you want? I turned my head, noticing the adult Yuzumaki sitting next to me, and immediately spotted the long object wrapped in a roll of expensive colored fabric in his hands. Soon you will leave our island and return to your village. But before that happens, on behalf of the entire clan, and at the request of the Yuzukage, 
I would like to present you with a couple of small gifts for timely warning us of the impending danger, Ryuji began somewhat solemnly. But since pomposity and excessive eloquence are not in favor with the Yuzumaki in such cases, I'll just say thank you. Always follow your heart's desire and don't forget your roots. And accept this gift from the entire Yuzumaki clan. After these words, he unwrapped the bundle revealing a katana, longer than my height, and adorned with black bone. Beautiful. I exclaimed, admiring the intricate carvings on the scabbard and handle, depicting battling dragons. Even sheathed, it was impressive. Like any representative of the strong side of humanity, I love to hold cold steel in my hands, and simply get acquainted with weapons of the past, luckily. The World Wide Web contained enough information about the creations that came out of the hands of famous blacksmiths. So, my gift, just by its appearance alone, was able to outshine anything ever seen. Her name is Kirachi, Grandpa announced, handing me the katana, and before you try to unsheathe her, drop some of your blood on the hilt. Why? I asked, nevertheless complying. Taking a small knife from my pocket, I pricked the tip of my index finger and smeared a droplet on the snarling dragon's face, whose body served as the handle. I was surprised when the crimson liquid instantly absorbed without a trace, and the tiny ruby eyes barely flickered. Now channel your chakra into the hilt, Grandpa demanded, explaining, this is part of the process of bonding the katana to the owner. The seals applied during its creation will remember you, and won't allow anyone else to unsheathe Kurauchi or hold it. Doing as instructed, I directed a small amount of chakra into the bone, and immediately withdrew my fingers. It felt like a weak electric shock ran through them. Now you can hold it, and by pressing here, Ryuji pointed to the scroll near the guard, you can draw it from the sheath. Taking the katana in my hands, I pressed when necessary and with a quiet click, I drew the blade from the scabbard. Since my hands were not long due to my young age, only half of the blade was visible, but even so, the dark matte metal, seemingly absorbing the light around it, made a great impression. Put the katana aside for now, you'll have plenty of time to admire it later, Grandpa smirked. I have another gift, now personal. Nodding, I returned Kurauchi to its sheath and placed it on the floor next to me, once again focusing all my attention on Ryuji. As you undoubtedly know, the biggest problem for all those with a large chakra reserve is Jinjutsu of any kind, affecting the victim's mind by deceiving all five senses, he began to explain. The Yuzumaki clan is no exception to this rule. For many years, our ancestors searched for a way to neutralize this weakness, and with the skills in Fuinjutsu, managed to create a set of seals, which are applied to every Yuzumaki. Upon reaching the rank of Chunin, since I'll hardly be able to see you in the near future, you will receive these seals now. How do they work? I asked, watching as Grandpa took his personal ink set from his pocket and spread it out nearby. The seals prevent someone else's chakra from penetrating your chakra channels in the head area, thereby rendering the use of Jinjutsu useless, he replied, as well as various techniques designed to delve into the brain, such as the Yamanaka clan's techniques and also have the ability to set mental bookmarks. Considering the presence of a Chiha in our village very useful seals, I agreed, does Karsen have them too? They were installed back when Ryuta come brought her to meet the relatives, Grandpa grinned. But let's not waste time and get down to applying them. I'll only need a few drops of blood from you for the ink. When everything is ready, all that remains is to imbue the seals with chakra, and the best protection against illusions will be provided. The entire complex of seals turned out to be quite extensive, and required several hours of sitting still. But I managed it. The activation turned out to be a greater unpleasantness. I had to sacrifice almost my entire chakra reserve, and all this was accompanied by sharp pain. As Ryuji explained, embedding into the channels always happen painfully, especially considering the overall frailty of my Karakuke and the unformed Tunketsu at the moment. But now, I have a huge advantage over the vast majority of Shinobi. Of course, Jinjutsu that work visually on the terrain will still function, but all the rest no longer. Lost in pleasant memories. I mechanically found my way through the crowd, and it's not surprising that eventually I bumped into someone. Recoiling from the collision, I couldn't stay on my feet and plopped down on the ground, quite landing on the soft spot. Senjutoka was leisurely walking down the street towards her clan's domain, almost ignoring the bows and greetings of the surrounding people, 
who showed their respect for one of the few individuals who personally witnessed the creation of Kenora. But all of this was not important to the aging Kinoichi, who at 80-something, barely looked half a century old. Her thoughts were occupied by the threat of the upcoming war, in which Leaf would ultimately be forced to engage, regardless of its leader's desires. The Senjo clan always traditionally fought in the forefront of Shinobi when the time for battle came, playing a significant role in the assault units of the army, as it was in the last world war. It was not only an honor, but also a huge risk with a deadly outcome in most cases, significantly undermining the once numerous Shinobi clan. Now, it numbered barely a third of the total that once populated the clan quarter on the day Kinovo was founded. And even then, the majority were children not yet in their 20s. With the threat of a new large-scale war, the number of Toka's clanmates could decrease even further, if not disappear altogether. In her time, the Kinochi witnessed the destruction of many clans, which no one remembers to this day. So there was nothing incredible about such an outcome. Especially, Toka was concerned about Saratobi, who rose to power with Toborama's last breath. No, he always treated his teacher's clanmates with pronounced respect. But there was a certain unpleasant feeling every time his gaze fell on the young shinobi then. Later, that feeling disappeared. But the memory of it resurfaced every time the aging Kinochi interacted with Hiruzen. And the Senjo always paid great attention to their feelings. Maybe a member of the Saratobi clan is not who he wants to seem. And not so long ago, an unpleasant incident with a hint of Danzo's people raises certain thoughts Toka shook her head no. Such reflections would lead to nothing, only more capable of confusion. Whatever happens, happens. Her clan always believed in the will of fire and responsibility to the village. Whatever happens, happens. The Senju were always renowned for their loyalty and responsibility. All members of the clan understood this, and if necessary, they would go through a new war without counting the sweat. The Kinochi's thoughts were interrupted when someone collided with her, quite sensibly banging their head into her stomach, and with a barely audible surprised groan, flew back. The weight difference between the collided turned out to be too great. Toka only slightly swayed and barely restrained the train killer reflexes from responding to the unexpected attack. Is age finally catching up not to sense in reflections that someone is running at you? Wondered the Kinochi, looking down, where a small boy of five or six years old, with dark red hair tied into a thick braid, dressed in clothes with the Nara clan emblem, was trying to get up from the ground, having fallen onto all fours. The collision obviously disoriented the little one, judging by the fact that he shook his head after flipping from his back. Are you okay? Stepping forward, Senju helped the little Nara get up. Yeah, I'm fine. He shook his head once more and finally lifted his piercingly clear gaze of bright green eyes to the Kinoichi. Thank you. Next time, watch where you're running, scolded Toka, helping him shake the dirt off his clothes. Sure thing. The boy nodded in agreement, flashing a dazzling smile and Senju couldn't help but return it. Um, excuse me, both Chan, are you Senju? Surprised, the woman nodded slowly. Why do you ask? She inquired. Just when they told us about the founding of the village, your clan and Ichiha were named as the founders. And while I've met a ton of people with fans over the past year, the boy gestured amusingly to indicate the size of this imaginary ton. I've only seen two with your emblem in person, counting this meeting. Why do you hide? If the general meaning of the speech was received by Toka with sadness, the child's straightforwardness and the very last question inadvertently made her smile. Unfortunately, our clan has greatly diminished since the founding of Kanoha, Senju said sadly, shaking her head. The last war was tough, and Leaf paid a bloody price for its victory, among which we suffered significant losses too. Sighing, the Kinochi shook her head, and looking down at the little Nara, she almost flinched when his face suddenly took on an extremely serious expression. So unlike children, and his piercing green eyes seemed to look straight into her soul. If Kinoha couldn't or didn't want to take care of its creators, then maybe it's time to take care of our own survival, rather than continuing to nurture an ungrateful child. That turned out unworthy of the care shown. Toka froze in place, unable to believe what she had just heard from a five-year-old. Reason refused to accept the fact that her tumultuous thoughts and fears, secret anxieties and doubts, 
hidden deep within her sharpened mind, which she would never admit to anyone, not even herself under threat of death, were just articulated. And by whom? A kid who had barely learned how to throw a kunai correctly. Both Chan. What's your name? Toka. The bewildered woman murmured, watching as all seriousness dissolved under the pressure of the child's immediacy. And I'm Ryu. Nice to meet you. But I gotta run, maybe we'll meet again and play together. Waving his hand, the boy dashed off, circling around Senju, and ran further down the street, unaware of how his words would affect the fate of this particular representative of the great clan, as well as the rest of its members. By the mouths of children, the gods speak, muttered the Kunoichi, ignoring the astonished looks of passers-by, continuing to watch the red-haired messenger of fate. A part of her mind mechanically noted and set aside the presence of something under the boy's short bangs, something very similar to the crystal adorning Mito Sama's forehead. Yuzumaki roots. Replaying everything said in her head once again, Toka took a deep breath, straightened up, and with renewed confidence, strode on. It was not the time to indulge in doubts and anxieties, when so much remains to be done. If she has to personally ensure that the great clan survives, then so be it. They sacrificed for their offspring for too long. It's time to collect the debt for those sacrifices, and take care of those who remain. Nothing and no one will stop the chosen path of the Senju. Quickly leaving the scene, all I could do was sigh with relief never expected to run into one of the oldest and strongest Senju just strolling down the street. And that involuntary impromptu I managed to deliver to the old lady seem more like the ravings of a visitor to the psychiatric ward. Hopefully, this conversation will lead to something positive. Senju looked concerned enough, and betting on a small piece of advice on the subject. I hope I didn't go wrong. In the worst case scenario, the clan of Kanoha's founders will cease to exist, leaving Tsunade as its last representative. An undesirable outcome, but the most likely one. Personally influencing the situation in the village, won't be possible for another 10 to 15 years. In the most optimistic scenario, in reality, until I earn the rank of Jonin and make it onto the A-ranked Shinobi list in the bingo book. Of course, there's still the method of indirect intervention, like the recent conversation, but here too much depends on chance. Temporarily pushing Senju and their problems out of my head, I picked up speed towards the market, a late dinner awaits me, and then back to studying. The first thing I did upon returning to the clan was to persuade the second grandpa to allow me to attend lectures by an Eonin, held by one of the Naras at the main hospital in Kanohara, and gain access to the medical knowledge of the clan. Nothing too complicated basic anatomy, types of injuries, first aid, and similar things. So, in addition to the already ingrained warm-up training of the Yuzumaki, training in the clan, practicing the creation of Haiden Jutsu, and Fuen Jutsu practice with chakra control. I also added lessons with an Eonin. Given the intense schedule, I doubt I'll have time for anything else in the next couple of years, except sleep and food. Thank goodness for shadow clones, otherwise, I wouldn't even have time for that. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going. Plus, it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.